Greetings. In this video, I'm joined by Spooky Appalachia. Hey. Yes, or, or Jimmy, right? Of, of the project yep. Spooky Appalachia. So, so could you, um, I guess, introduce yourself and explain what your what your project is? Okay. So, I think you were around when I started it at the very beginning, when it was just the blog site, two and a half or so years ago. Um, basically, I was kind of doing the same thing you were doing uh, with the Appalachian Oddity blog, uh, collecting stories, some of, some from uh, Appalachia that, you know, the, the well-known ones. And then I started uh, getting uh, stories from some folks. They, they started sharing their stories with me. Um, and then they started, at, people started asking me to uh, do audio for the stories. I thought I didn't have the voice for it, so I got my brother-in-law to do the uh, read the stories out on YouTube, and that kept that took off big time, and it kept growing and growing and growing. Um, we had people ask, you know, what these places look like that, that lived in far-off places like the Mothman Museum, the TNT area, Flatwoods Monster Museum. And, you know, I live like two-ish hours away from a lot of it. So, and then the Mothman Museum, I go to, as you know, a couple times a year because I help Jeff and them out at the museum. So it was just a matter of time before I could film that. And people started loving that and the stories. So I was doing location shoots from my area of some of those places and uh, featuring people's stories. And it's it's... It just keeps growing and growing and growing. Now I'm at over 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. I forget what it was the last time I checked. But really, I oh my brother-in-law dropped off the channel, and I do the stories now. And I thought I didn't have the voice for it, but people say they like it more with me reading them. They also say they love my accent. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I have an accent. I don't think you have an accent either. Yeah, I get you. I mean, I think I think your voice is decent enough for like a like a radio uh, narration thing. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the accent thing, I don't know. I've had people tell me that uh, that they didn't believe I was from West Virginia because they couldn't hear an accent. So, but then other people think I do. Well, so. I, yeah, I think you know some of the s same people I know, like uh, Joe from uh, Wild and Weird, mm -hmm. Jeff Wamsley, um, drawing some blanks on some of the same people. Uh, Best Virginian. I don't think any of them have accents either. They they all sound normal to me, but maybe that's because I have an accent and I'm used to it. <laughs> I don't know. Could be. I mean, you sound normal to me too, so I don't know. I I could be wrong. So so with your project, uh, it is it's the the website Suki Appalachia, mm -hmm. uh, and then the YouTube, which is like a, the YouTube. A... Yeah, the YouTube's got way more more stuff on it because I actually do interviews from, or I've started doing interviews with people who have sent me stories, like the really outstanding ones. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get them back on and interview them. Um, the YouTube's got the location videos that aren't on the website, then me reading the uh, stories that are sent, and then I do a couple of other things like reaction videos to paranormal clips and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's SpookyAppalachia.com, and then there's the mm -hmm. YouTube. And on the YouTube, you do, like, uh, readings of the sightings mm -hmm. that you get. And yep. I've seen you also do, like, some kind of, like, video tours of interesting locations that you go to. Yep. Yeah, I, ju I just did the Mothman Festival and College Hill Hospital. They saw one of my uh, other videos. They are in uh, Welch, West Virginia. They've actually started coming on some paranormal shows lately. I don't really watch the ghost hunting stuff, but uh, I'd heard of it. And I saw they followed me on Twitter, and then I said something to them, and uh, they invited me up. They, they were like, oh, wow, we love your videos. I was like, wow, really? Hmm. But, like, I've got flyers with a QR code up at the Mothman Museum and all over Point Pleasant. So that's also been probably part of why it's been growing so rapidly mm -hmm. yeah I saw, I saw the sticker with the logo being put oh yeah the the hospital you mentioned i looked it up that i think that is the one that was um 
like related to some of the the mine wars type stuff down there yes like the... it was that was the hospital that uh they treated those folks at yeah so i have heard of that one yeah uh, a paranormal investigator who i know was gonna go do that and then i was invited but didn't get to go to that so that i've at least been invited to that before <laughs> It's uh, it's a really cool place. I'll send you the video later if you want. Mm -hmm. we're, like, we're we're doing a second one on the haunts and history that's going to come out later. I just need to re-record the audio audio because the audio went out in the middle of it. I'm, I've been working with the lady that owns it to dub over it, <laughs> but it's coming out good. Yeah. So I watched uh, a bunch of videos in preparation for the interview. Oh, cool. So, yeah, I saw the uh, castle thing. In Virginia, oh, yep, and the the other location in Virginia, like Blacksburg, and oh, Alexander House. That one's an interesting. Well, those two are both interesting ones because people have seen those and invited me to do more videos at places. And the the tunnel one as well. Which tunnel, Sensibo or the uh, what is it, Great? Ben with the John Henry? Uh, the the more haunted tunnel, the one with the, the graffiti and stuff. Oh, that's Sensaba Tunnel. That one's actually kind of famous, too. Yeah, so, so I watched a bunch of the videos. Some, some good stuff there. I like that. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like just casually looking around at a location, so it's, it's fun to watch mm -hmm. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm not really into ghost hunting, but I, I do like going and checking out these places that uh, the, all these stories kind of wrap around and legends. It, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yep, the the classic legend tripping. Well, that's yep. usually referred uh, yeah, to. I guess that's exactly what it is. Yeah, so I, I kind of like that uh, the approach of just like you know casually showing up, looking at the place, you know, as opposed to like the big production with the the, the drone shots and the spooky music and you know the title sequence yeah. and all that. So yeah, I, I kind of appreciate that. Just like the old school kind of YouTube is like, here I am, I have a camera, I'm looking around. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. and, and you're a decent host as well, I think. Thanks. With your um, with your sightings and stuff, where do you get them mostly from? Is it from like your email or Facebook or? Oh, all over the place. Um, email. Uh, I've got a Google form set up for it that I put in the description. Uh, a lot of them come through either email or uh, Facebook Messenger or uh, DMs on Twitter. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Well, it's X now, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, with your channel there, you also have like other people there who are doing the read-throughs of the signs and stuff like that. So you have a bit of a team. So what's the deal with that? They're uh, like my, my friend Donald, uh, you've probably seen in a, a lot of the location videos, and he's recorded someone on his own. Um, he and I have been friends for like 25 years. W with the, the story readings, it w was my brother-in-law, and then uh, my friend Jared, who's got a... a big channel I'm, I'm met, i've met a lot of people doing this a lot of great people but jared from jared king tv comes on a lot a couple of my friends i'm trying to think off the top of my head but yeah a couple of my friends help me out with it or, or like to come with me on the location shoots my buddy alvin does it's just people i've i've known for many years well, that's cool I've seen from the videos I watched, I watched some of the older ones, watched some of the newer ones, and you can, you can see the improvement and stuff. It's very, it's very cool. You can see, like, oh, uh, you, know, you step out in front of the camera and as, and as opposed to just being the, the voiceover before. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I watched a lot of people who, who did, like, travel videos and stuff, and I at first I was like, I don't want to be in the videos. I don't want people to know, find me, but I, I was like, uh, they, they'll probably never find me. <laughs> I, I think I also early on was doing like behind the scenes just narration and then, then as well i stepped out in front of the camera like it's more interesting to have someone out in front of the camera yeah, and talk. yeah it i believe it uh it gives the the viewers kind of like a like a a bond just to be able to see someone you know mm -hmm. yeah put themselves in the, in the shoes of the person there the, in yeah, the location yeah, yeah exactly and like, like you said, some of the people that are watching uh, have probably never been to West Virginia or uh, experienced yep. the locations before, so it's a cool thing yeah, to see. Yeah, I've got a lot of people in the UK and all over America, and I think there's some people in Japan that watch me too, and those are the ones that comment that I know of, and they're like, oh, wow. I, I've got a lot of Fallout fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Fallout, Fallout 76. 76, yeah, got me a lot of people. Yeah, there's some stuff that uh, I guess you, living in Appalachia, you kind of 
uh, just take as normal or take for granted, and then you yeah you, exactly you, you film it and you put it online. And people are like, "Whoa, that's so interesting." Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Um, it's I'm, I did play Fallout seventy six and like I, like you know like the New River Gorge Bridge or the Mothman Museum or uh, I'm trying to think of some more the 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 Great Bend Tunnel, which is like an hour from the house that I've been to a couple times. People people just lost it when I, I filmed that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep, and and some of the stuff like uh, for for example, I was uh, with my mother and we were driving down this uh, this road and there was like these scraggly trees growing up over the road and stuff like that. And so I, I had my camera and I'm like filming it in the passenger seat. And she's like, "What are you filming this for? Is this a normal road?" And I'm like, "No, this this road looks creepy. It's it's spooky looking." <laughs> and, you yeah, know? yeah. So yeah, so people just find that kind of stuff normal. The the spookiness of like the woods and the wilderness. But, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I was gonna say that uh, yeah, your channel the the quality's improved, and I, I like the the frequency. You you post a lot more often than I do, you know, so that's pretty cool. That's uh, that's good for engagement and for you know for the channel to grow is for constant videos. That's what YouTube's all about. But you know, my my products yeah. seem to take a little bit longer, you know. So that's well, cool. your yours has some your your content has a really really good quality. I I don't know, man. I don't guess it's rushed. I I don't know. I do, I do put a lot of time into it, but. It also take it takes up a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've I've tried to make more casual type videos, but I, I always get, you know, hung up on things and and try to make it like the perfectionist stuff. So yeah, I'm trying to make more videos where you kind of turn on the camera, you talk for a bit, you turn it off, or you just go to location and don't think too much about it. So yeah, I, I envy that. That's a a good skill to have. Just you know, just to be able to make the content instead of like mm -hmm. you know keep working on it forever until you yeah. you know it's way overdone. So does your project have like a mission statement, like what the, the goal or the purpose is? Um, I guess it's to really to share people's, I, I've never said anything officially, but it's really to share stories from folks that like before I even did all this, you know, but I just liked like the stories. I mean, I guess it's like the, the, the paranormal type stories. I've always liked listening to those and that's really all I like about it. I, you know, I like hearing the stories. I like seeing the places. Heck, I, I've gotten a decent amount of traffic to some of these places too. Like College Hill, uh, the lady told me they've had uh, four or five people call from my video. That's awesome. <laughs> and the Ingalls Castle place, they were going to sell it, but they reconsidered selling it. They're trying to start up ghost tours to try and save the 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 place they they can't afford to just keep it up because of the property taxes and what all there's that i may i might have saved that place you know that's that's awesome that means a lot to me and then you know helping out a small business like the people that have uh the college hill hospital um Oh, and uh, that Alexander House video, the town of Blacksburg, Virginia. I'm helping them start up a ghost tour with uh, some stories that people have sent me from that area, from locations. So that's that it. is that is so awesome. Yeah, that's like, some it good blows stuff. my mind. Yep, that's some good grassroots stuff there. Yeah, uh, and I'm a, I'm a small channel too. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Some some organizing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I think we probably have. Uh, similar similar goals in mind or similar things that draw us to uh the subject matter of you know folklore and appalachian and strangeness mm -hmm. and all that good stuff because uh you, you have the spooky and i have the odd yeah. but we both got the <laughs> the appalachian yeah i the the weird thing i i thought of the name and i don't know how i came across your site but uh i, I came across it just like a couple days after I think I found your wiki and I added a, a link to the moth cam, which I do for the Mothman Museum. And then that wiki led me to your site. I think that's what it was. I, I was Googling Mothman stuff for a story and found your wiki, I believe. Hmm. If that's still around, I don't know if it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was the, the old project. I'm kind of, kind of moving things towards the, the new project, AppalachianOddity.org. Okay. So, yeah, I got... Um, Kind of like a database going on in that site yeah, for yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. No, I tell people who uh, are like content creators, you know, if they don't find something on my site, to check yours too. Well, I appreciate that. There's a guy in England that told me he uses your site pretty often. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. I'm trying to trying to update it more, add more data, add more sightings, and all that. So yeah, that's cool. 
You've got one of mine on there, I believe. Oh yeah, I have a an article that I did about the spirits of lockdown 2020, and, and you mm -hmm. told a a woman in white story that took mm -hmm. place in 2020. So I added that in there. That's that's in the article. Yep. And I, I added a I submitted a story for your site, the the UFO story. Oh yes, yes you did. That was a cool one. It, it was it it reminded me of the one that I had as a kid, kind of too. Yep. So we both have stories on the other website. There you go. Yep. Yep. So yeah, I was I was gonna tell the story of uh, how we came in contact. Yeah, you uh, had the the moth cam thing. I actually saw the moth cam thing like all the way back in like 2016, 2017. It was a a cool thing that they had the the moth cam. I think at first it was just on the moth thing museum website. Yeah, on the website, and then mm -hmm. came over to YouTube. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I, I I think I recorded the screen and used that as a background for like a video I did a, a long time ago, like a time lapse of like the it turned day to night the Mothman statue. That's really cool. Oh, uh, I don't know if you knew, saw this on my channel or if I ever told you, but I had some people write in that there was a UFO on the moth cam, and I grabbed the video of it. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it was just a meteor, but it was still really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for, for the folks at home, you should explain uh, your connection to the museum and the moth cam. Oh, yeah, so I was at the Mothman Museum, I think it was 2017, for the second time. And there was a sign that uh, said the moth cam, check the moth cam, and then underneath it, out of order. We've got some family that live in Ohio, so we, we stopped by a couple times, you know, on the way to Ohio, because that's how you get to Ohio. And uh, Jeff's daughter was working at the museum, and I said, hey, what's what's going on with the moth cam? Because I had done my first, I had just done my first YouTube channel, and uh, I knew a little bit about it. I was like, hey, do you, do you got, and plus I've got an IT background. I was like, do you guys need help with that? And uh, she took my name and number, and then like a month later, I think it was, Jeff contacted me. I went up there, and I fixed it. But the problem was it kept going back out, and that was because people were, it, it was served up there from a computer at the museum. And people would go to it, and it would overload it because the internet wasn't very good there. And then, um, I think it was 2019, maybe, I, I moved it to YouTube. I was like, oh, well, YouTube hosts it. Then uh, that takes the load off the uh, computer at the museum and the internet. And oh, by the way, it, it fixed all kinds of IT problems they were having when I did that too. By the way, because that you know they were it was slowing down their internet and stuff. So I got it on there, and then I've done a couple little extra things to it here and there over the years to make it cooler. Uh, right now, I've got like two cameras set up, and um, it switches back and forth between them. Jeff and I took a mannequin upstairs to where the escape room is going to be and uh, dressed it up as a man in black and put put it behind the uh the the top floor camera and i, I took a picture at the festival of it you it's got the camera pointing down and uh, there's a man in black standing behind of it he calls it the mib camera and then i i've also just done a bunch of random it and website stuff for them over the years and for their businesses like you saw the Flappy Mothman uh, thing I built. That's mm -hmm. that's one of the things I did. That that took like three years, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, it's a mini arcade thing, like yep. a wooden box with a. It's like a Flappy Bird, but it's Mothman going up and down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a little touch screen game. It's up at the three hundred four bunker right now. Like it, it's it's on display right now. Uh, the plan is it's going to go into the museum at some point. And when he gets time to build a, like a retro Mothman display, I think is what his plan was for it. But right now it's up at the bunk, the 304 bunker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the Point Pleasant, all the all the shops and stuff have changed a lot since last I've been there. They like the, new yeah, ones have popped uh, up and all that sort of thing. Yeah, the trading company is now side by side with the museum. Uh, there, there's just a, there's a really cool ice cream shop you'll see if you watch my festival video that Jeff partially owns. Um, there's a bunch of stuff. It's changed so much in just a couple years. Yep, and the the museum's expanding now to like the up, uh, upper store. Yep, and uh, there's going to be a indoor cryptid uh, mini golf course. Wow, he's, so that's another project he's working on. Um, I'm going to be helping out with that, with that a little bit too. Hmm. 
So, so the museum's getting bigger, and then there's going to be uh -huh. an escape room and a mini golf thing. The, oh. the escape room's like 90 or so percent done. It, not quite, but it's almost there. But he's been... He's just been uh, having a hard time getting materials for stuff over the past couple of years. I mean, that's crazy. Like, we're slowly seeing Mothman just take over the whole town. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you got the museum, you got the statue, and then you got, like, Bunker 304 is, you know, related to, like, the bunkers and stuff. And then you got all the all the Mothman-themed gift shops and stuff. It's, it's you know. And then, of there's... course, when the, when the festival comes, there's, like, all the vendors with all the Mothman stuff. So, yeah, the whole yep, town yep. has become Mothman-themed ever so slowly. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, people. I, I I just put out the video this morning of the festival, but uh, people are writing in. They're like, "Oh, it's so cool! You know all about all these businesses and stuff. No one else who's done a video does." So that uh, that made me feel good. And I did a video tour of the TNT area last year, and I got similar kind of comments to that. Uh, people said that uh, the people that did the videos only did like the the first bunker or two but i did i went in the middle of winter you've been out there haven't you to the tnt area it's yep. hot it's muggy if you go in the summer or spring and sometimes fall it's just mm -hmm. miserable but if you go in the middle of winter you could just i went all the way out to the end and then over to the next row in the video and uh we took a kayak out in the water in the middle mm -hmm. yeah i saw that People video loved it oh you did yeah, it was, oh, it was cool. pretty good. Um, my video is just me going around to all the different bunkers, and it doesn't have any like audio or commentary. Okay. It's, it's just like music in the background and maybe like the bunker noises. But yeah, I think I saw that actually. You mm -hmm. you were with a couple of other people. Yeah, I think I have I have, I have multiple videos about the bunkers. I have a, a day one and a night one, and then I have some videos where it's time at the festival, and then we go to the bunkers. And there there's one of course where I was with paranormal investigators and we did like an investigation at the bunkers and that was fun but I yeah i didn't see that i saw one where you had some music going and you went to some of the bunkers i think that was but yeah I, that's props to you i don't know if i would want to go out there at night myself mm, yeah i know uh, many of your videos in the daytime and which is which is good for you know visually seeing the stuff you know mm -hmm. But yeah, the bunkers is like a section of the pond that uh, at certain times a year, like the water rises up, like it, it crosses the path and yeah, then sometimes yeah. it's lower and you have to walk across it. So yeah, it depends on what time of, time of year you're going down there. But I, I've been all the way down to the, the end of it with the um, the exploded bunker. It has it's no so, roof on that it. That is so cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was cool. And then it, um, you're right, it goes down to another path and you can go down mm -hmm. around cause all these little pathways have the, the igloos dotted around because they were... Yep, I think uh, there's... A, I, last I had heard, there's about 100 or so igloos. Mm -hmm. they're, they're dotted around so that uh, military from the air couldn't take them all out at once. Yep. And there's there was still munitions in the one that exploded, you know? Yeah, that one, I think I heard... I forget who from, that it was privately owned or something, and the guy was keeping something in there, mm -hmm. and, and it... it, it I, I don't know why it exploded, but he I'd heard he did something irresponsible or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, who knows? But uh, your video did something that, uh, that I couldn't do, which is have a, a kayak out there. Oh, I, I yeah. Never, never done that. That's kind of yeah. wild. Cause like... But I know where the submerged bunker is at now, Jeff told me. It, it was where we thought it was in the video. I think we mentioned it a little bit where we thought it was, mm -hmm. but that's where it is. It's partially <laughs> submerged anyway. <laughs> Yeah, some people might be worried about being in anywhere near the water because they, they'd be afraid of like turning radioactive or starting to glow in the dark or something. No, that water, um, they actually monitor it and it's actually mostly okay that, as long as you don't drink it now. Okay. M mostly okay is good. I guess. Mostly okay. If, if you just don't drink it, it's okay. <laughs> or possibly eat fish in it if there's fish in it. I, I've been told there's fish in it. I've never seen any. Mm hmm personally okay so so if you fall in, in in the canoe then don't have your mouth open <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so yeah there's that the, the tnt video um but yeah you, you're saying it, it people people like that you know things about the town and i agree that's yeah. good that's a good thing to be knowledgeable about the tnt you know, area what's weird is uh yeah. <laughs> people will like ask me for directions in town sometimes when i'm there and I know where I know where to send them. I know where they're trying to like. I can actually help them. 
I, I realized that one day, and I was like, oh, I guess I do know this stuff. <laughs> like, it was just people asking, how do I get to blah or whatever? How do you get to the TNT area and that, that kind of stuff? Or where's the Mexican restaurant? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, wow, I, I know this stuff. That's cool. Yep. I've been the tour guide a bit before, too. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. I like uh, Village Pizza, by the way. That's where the um, Scarborough Mounts went after their, their sighting, to the, that area there. It was Tiny's Diner at the time. Now it's Village Pizza. Okay. I I personally haven't had it, but I can't have gluten or dairy, so that's my excuse for it. Yeah, fair enough. I'm just talking about the, yeah. the actual location itself, not necessarily the food. Well, the so... location itself. So, yeah, people, I, I've gotten a lot of uh, flack for not having a Mothman pizza ever, and then I say, oh, well, <laughs> I can't eat it. They're like, oh, well, actually, that makes sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. So in, in Point Pleasant, there's uh, the T interior bunkers, and then there's the actual place where the siding is supposed to take place, which is uh, the North Power Plant, which is now just a foundation. Mm -hmm. And then there's that famous drive from there back into town, and the the farm right before it gets back into town it was the, the creature veered off and went into that field, and that's when the, the siding ended, because it like veered away as they entered the, the lights of town. And they speculated that the creature might be afraid of lights. Oh, really? I didn't know that part. I also wondered myself how they got up to 100 miles an hour on that road. Mm -hmm. Well, they said it was only on the, the straight stretch of road. where that They said when they reached that point, they were going up to 100 miles an hour. And of course, they were in uh, Roger Scarberry's black 1957 Chevy. Yep. Yeah, maybe. I, I think it was a gravel road, possibly, or a dirt road, but... It was more like when you get into town, it's more paved and it's near that. Oh, that actually makes more sense than the, uh, that, I was thinking that stretch of road right as you come out of the bunkers that uh, goes past the, you know, like all the corn stalks. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I always thought they got up to 100 in, but that, what you're saying makes more sense. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Roger Scarberry liked to, to race cars. He, he souped up his 57 Chevy and they were. Oh, they, okay. And the T interior was kind of like a place to show off cars and do like yeah, drag racing. Was, yep. So, yeah, they went down there to show off their cars and stuff and to chase people away. They said they were going to chase Parkers. And, uh, you know, they, they saw the creature. Uh, it was by the North Power Plant. And the setup was Roger Scarberry was in the driver's seat. Steve Mallett was in the passenger seat. And Mary Mallett and Linda Scarberry were in the back seat. And they said that Steve Mallett was the one who saw the eyes first. And... Then, of course, you know, they all freak out. They drive away. The creature takes them in the air and starts following them. And uh, Mary and Linda are looking out the back glass, and they can see the creature you know, swooping back over their car. It's like swoops down low. It goes back and forth. It like circles them. But it never goes in front of their headlights. And so that's another reason why they think that maybe it was afraid of lights, because it wouldn't go in front of their headlights. And it follows them all the way into town, and then it veers off as they go into, into the actual lights of town. And then they go to Tiny's Diner, and that's where they call the police, and they, they have to sit there and debate about if they should call the police or not, because they don't know mm -hmm. if they'll be believed or what the right thing to do is. Um, but actually, before they call the police, they go back down the road, because they want to see the creature still there. So they go back down the road a little bit, and that's when the creature supposedly jumps over their car, and that's when they, they saw the dead dog in the road that wasn't yeah, there Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, so, I think that was that uh, dog bandit. With its, or uh, It was believed that it was that dog bandit that went missing. Yeah, it was speculated because it's kind of an interesting detail that they would claim to see a, a dead dog in the road that was then later not there, and then there happens to be a, a German Shepherd missing. You know, they never said, like, yep. specifically it was a German Shepherd, but it's an interesting little detail, so it kind of lines up. And then, so after the, the creature jumps over their car, then they they head back, they, they call the police, they go to the Tiny's Diner and get the people to call the police there. Yeah, there's a misconception that's actually in the Moth and Prophecies. Keel writes, John Keel, the author of the Moth and Prophecies, writes that uh, they went to the Mason County Courthouse, but they never did that. They actually just went to the Yes, Tiny's. I was going to say, I thought I, re I remembered that, but no, I, okay. Yeah, the witness testimony, the actual like writing things that are in the Mothman Museum, and uh, some of the earlier reports and stuff, they, they said they, they went to Tiny's Diner and called the police, so Keel had got that, that information there wrong and was like misremembering or thinking that they went to all the way to the courthouse. Yeah, it was Sheriff George Johnson, Deputy Miller Halstead, uh, those are the police that arrived and looked around the property and didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's that's simply how monster sightings go. Is a uh, creature decided they, they, if they call the police, then the police show up and uh, the creature is now gone. You know, they can never prove that the creature was there. All right. 
even though there there's a part in there in one of the in the testimony where it says that while the sheriff was shining around a flashlight, they saw something they saw movement or something around the power plant. But so it was never something that you know was seen by the police there or proven. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's 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 a classic sighting, the Mothman story. The that's thing the that's, one that sparked most of it. Yeah, the the November fifteenth, nineteen sixty six sighting, the Scarberry Mount sighting. It mm-hmm. started it all. So yeah, when when you go to Point Pleasant, you're typically trying to like retrace those steps. But um, you know, then of course there were all the other sightings. So some of them were in town, and some of them were in the TNT area. Some of them were like uh, Marcella Bennett, who lived in an area near the TNT area, and uh, there was Virginia was Thomas. Houses. Yeah, there was little houses out there. Um, there was the sighting Virginia Thomas in 1967 who had a sighting near the bunkers. So there is that. But yeah, so when people, sometimes when people tour the bunkers and they talk about them, they say, oh, this is where the, the creature was sighted. It's like, well, no, it was actually near the North Power Plant. But, you know, there were some sightings around there in the bunker. So, you know, technically, you know, kind of depends on if you mean just in general was seen there or if you mean the, the famous one, the, the November 15th, 1966 one. Right. And I think I've told you, people actually send me Mothman sighting stories. Yeah, I've seen some of those on, on your website, the more the modern Mothman sightings. The... Yeah, I actually got one from Point Pleasant that happened back in December. They were two uh, teenagers driving around at night, and they saw something strange on um, the side of a road. And they uh, drive towards it, and uh, they, they see red eyes and something jump up in the air and fly off. And it followed them for a bit, I think, before flying off completely. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it's interesting. People still uh, claim to see it. I get, I get uh, probably one or two sightings sent to me a, a month. And mm-hmm. those actually, I actually forgot to mention. You asked where some of them come from. Um, I actually have a Facebook group that's got over ten thousand people on it called Mothman Sightings. Hmm. Um, I get a lot of stuff from that too. Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. You said it, it followed them. That's a, a common uh, trend in the the Mothman sightings from it the sixties, seventies. The the creature follows their car and stuff like that. Yeah, when somebody tells me it looks like it looked like a cross between a man and a bird, that's mm-hmm. when I, it, that usually catches my attention. I've had some that said it was it looked like a a, a giant moth. Um, I'm just like, oh, well, that. That's not quite it, but it could just be how they're perceiving it, you know? <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I get you. Because uh, mm-hmm. some people don't realize that the, the Mothman was supposed to be like a giant bird creature that mm-hmm. was you know, half half bird, half man type thing. Um, yeah, because it, it was like six, seven feet tall, 10 to 15 foot wingspan, uh, glowing red eyes. Some of the early sightings were reflective. Later, they were more glowing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was uh, the original Scarberry Mallet one was light gray in coloration. Yeah, I was gonna say some of them, uh, the the ones back then, the colors were. I, I'd never heard of a back then a complete black, but kind of what I had heard was uh, like kind of dark gray or dark brown mostly. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it was more feathery back in the day. Mm-hmm. The the name being Mothman is kind of a misnomer, and that led to some people in like artwork and stuff depicting it as more moth like. And you know you yep. see that even with the statue, very very moth like. Mm-hmm. So that confuses people, and then people oh, yeah. say they see the the moth creature. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, even this shirt has kind of a moth looking thing on it. Mm-hmm. And with some of the, the the fan art, it's like it's supposed to be fun and cutesy. It makes Mothman look kind of like small, but you got to remember he's like six or seven feet tall, and they had the little feelers. And I think uh, because Mothman's coloration could be gray or brown. I think people are kind of split the difference and just make it kind of shadowy in the dark. You can't fully see it. So it's like mm-hmm. a silhouette. And so people think that Mothman might be like completely dark. But, you know, the early witnesses described him as light gray. And some of them said lunar, which is an interesting description. Like like the moon. Lunar. Yeah, so it's like oh, white. Yeah. It's like a dirty gray white lunar. Yeah. Yeah, the um the people in Point Pleasant, they always refer to it as the bird. Just, yep, just the bird. Yep. And then uh, the Huntington newspapers are the ones that started calling it Mothman. Yeah, the um the Huntington newspaper, the Huntington Herald Dispatch, uh, Thursday, November seventeenth, nineteen sixty six. Bird, plane, or Batman? Mason Countyans hunt quote Mothman, and it, the moth space man, and that was by Patricia Seiler. So that's the earliest known uh title with the word Mothman. It, it's kind of like a tongue in cheek thing, and mm-hmm. it's uh, a parody based on you know the Batman TV show it was popular at the time, yeah. the Adam West nineteen sixty six one. 
So it's kind of a misnomer, but the people in town just call it the bird. But you really couldn't yep. you couldn't do that on a on a national scale. You couldn't just call it the bird, you know. It's not as appealing, I guess. The bird, you know. Yeah, people, people, yard. yeah, people in town know what you're talking about because everyone's read the paper and they know, know what's up. But you know, mm -hmm. someone in another state's gonna be like, "What bird?" You know, you call it the yeah, exactly, exactly, the, the Point Pleasant bird or something like that. Yeah. My favorite one that I heard was uh, there's a newspaper that report that calls it the UFO bird. Like that was good. The UFO bird. That's a good yes. one. That's what it should be called because it's all the UFO well, sightings. Well, yeah, it was, a, it was often associated with them, with UFOs or mm -hmm. all the UFO sightings and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. people people uh, know of the the Mothman, but you, a lot of them don't know about all the UFO sightings that were going on around the same time. There, mm -hmm. there was actually way more UFO activity. Mm -hmm. And there was the Men in Black and all that sort of thing, and there was mm -hmm. poltergeist activity and oh psych yeah, psychic phenomena and all that sort of thing. Yep. Whole, Andrew Cold. Yep, whole big thing. Although Andrew Cold was all the way in Parkersburg, though. But yeah, that was the same time, November 66. All that's, um, you know, documented in Keel's book, Moth and Prophecies, goes into the whole thing. Keel, his original title for the Moth and Prophecies was The Year of the Garuda. And he called Mothman, really? called Mothman the American Garuda. And Garuda is a Hindu bird god. So he was kind of comparing oh, those that's two. that's interesting. Yeah, he was comparing those two. And then the publisher said that uh, Moth and Prophecies was a better title. Oh. Huh. Yeah, I'd heard that he he made he had to make a lot of revisions to it because of the publishers. I haven't read his second book, the the follow up to it that that's supposedly more uh, in tune with what he he really wanted to write. Mm -hmm. The the Eighth Tower is a uh, like yes. A, I need oh, to order that and read it. Yeah, it's like the follow up. It's the like the leftover material that he wasn't allowed to put in the book. Yep. But you know, if he had it his way, those those two books would basically be one book. You have it all together. Mm -hmm. The Moth and Prophecies actually began as like a, it was going to be a collaboration between him and West Virginia researcher Gray Barker. So he was actually oh, going to, really? yeah, they were going to collaborate. And of course that went south and Keel put out the Moth and Prophecies and Barker put out uh, the Silver Bridge in 1970. So he I've actually, got that book. I haven't read it. Although Keel also released a book, uh, Creatures from Time and Space, which has a bunch yeah. of monster sightings in it. And that one has a chapter on Mothman. So basically, you know, he took what he was working on and made it into that chapter and then wrote the full book years later in 75. And then uh, Eighth Tower is like the follow-up of the stuff that wasn't allowed in the book. Mm -hmm. He's also got a book about UFOs, Operation Trojan Horse. That was the same year, 1970. It's his big theory about UFOs and all that. And he's a very fascinating author. Uh, oh yeah, I was going to say that if, you know, if the Moth and Prophecies wasn't called the Moth and Prophecies, it could have been you know the whole history of Mothman could have been changed. People might have called it by a different name, and then the festival wouldn't be called that, the museum yeah. wouldn't be called that. Yeah, you could have the UFO Bird Festival, the UFO Bird Museum. <laughs> the UFO Bird Festival? The Bird of Point Pleasant Museum. Huh. So, some people thought Mothman was an angel, like the angel of Point yeah, Pleasant. I've heard that too. And there were, there were people actually at the festival that were arguing that during a talk that I went to. Mm -hmm. So you went to uh, some of the guest speaker stuff then? Yeah, um, I had more, uh, one of the speakers uh, works at the museum, uh, Steve Ward. Mm -hmm. I've actually had him on the channel before, but uh, he's a friend of mine, so I, I'm, I went by and listened to his talk and another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's a good researcher. He's a Fordian, and he's a big fan of John Keel. Yeah, he's a huge fan. So yeah, so we were, we were talking about how uh, Mothman's kind of slowly taken over all the, the shops around Point Pleasant. Um, it started all with just uh, Jeff Wamsley's record store, Criminal Records. Yep, yep. He had my dad uh, actually went by there when he was in college and talked to Jeff. Yep. He had Mothman T-shirts. Yep. And he made the the website Mothman Lives. Yep, which is still around. Um, I, I'm I'm allowed. I've I've got permissions to. I think that's where the the Mothman stories started coming to me. Uh, Jeff gave me permission to use those anytime I want. Mm -hmm. And I started including those and posting them, the videos on that Mothman sightings group. And then I think that's when people started uh, sending those in. And it, it's kind of snowballed since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives it some officialness. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, he, he used to collect, uh, like, user-submitted sightings back on that website back in the day. Yep. Yeah. I actually had to fix that website for him not too long ago. Some bad mm -hmm. code or something. Yeah, the, the museum came about from, like, uh, first started off with the shirts and then like people mm -hmm. coming in asking about Mothman 
and he eventually put together like a little manila envelope that he would give people with you know information about mothman you know and then eventually he made the book you know the the facts behind the legend to mm -hmm. you know for people to read but all the stuff he had and um i've got a son copy of that actually yeah. and he, he was uh he interviewed he went around interviewing people like linda scarberry and his neighbors and people who had seen the mothman then he made he made that book and he Start collecting things for the museum, such as the the clippings. Linus Scarberry gave him those newspaper clippings, the ones you see, and the handwritten reports. Yep. And then he knew someone who had a a, a a grocery store, Kroger's grocery store, that had uh the guy had bought props from the Mothman Prophecies movie because the movie was. Oh filmed. yeah, he's got Richard Gre Gears uh chapstick. <laughs> You've probably seen that, right? Mm -hmm. I thought that was hilarious. And a, and a blanket that he used. Oh, he's got uh, the the original um, inter interview tapes from uh, the 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 uh, injured cold interview with uh, Woodrow. Mm -hmm. Woodrow there Amber. too. Yeah. Yep. Susan he's, Shepherd. He's got all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Susan Shepherd saved those and put them on loan at the museum. Yeah. So there there was a guy who owned a Kroger's. Uh, I think it was Pennsylvania where they filmed the actual yep. movie. So, I always thought that was weird. They filmed it in Pennsylvania. But yeah, so he was able to get the props after that because the the guy displayed them in his Kroger's for a while while the movie was still big and popular. But then when the hype kind of died down from that, he uh, would show up at the festival and and have the props. So all of it kind of assembled and kind of came together, and was able to put the museum together. And uh, Lauren Coleman said he was there to suggest to Jeff to make the museum and the festival and all that sort of thing. And then he hmm. and uh, owner of the Mothman Diner. Carolyn Harris was able to, you know, organize yeah, that all that. Harris Diner, yeah. Mm -hmm. The Mothman Diner. I was I was able to go to the Mothman Diner a few times where it closed down, so that was cool. That's yeah. I I think we ate there once. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of Mothman stuff the first time I went there. It just the it was just the museum at, at that old location, and we saw the Harris Diner like a Harris Diner sign, and we were like, oh wait, that's down there. And we went and ate there. Mm -hmm. Some of the Harris Diner stuff is now in the museum. Yeah, it is. He's moved things around, but uh, n now the Harris Diner stuff goes into like a media, a big, bigger media room now, mm -hmm. where he's gotten more space. So that's kind of cool. Yep, she was a uh, uh, someone who really believed in the Mothman. You know, actually believed in the stories and said, "Yeah, the Mothman." Did she here. have a sighting? Uh, I'm not sure. I think she mostly just you know believed the people who oh, said okay. they saw the Mothman and would say, "Yeah, Mothman's real." She, when she did interviews. Okay. Um, I know the coffee grinder has a T-shirt that says "He's still here" with two red eyes over Mason County. So it's, it's pretty cool. People are like, "No, the Mothman still here," you know, because people think, "Yeah, like, okay, like maybe um, it's not there anymore." They also have a really good uh, Mothman coffee at the grinder. Yeah, there there was a a lady who worked there at the coffee grinder who said her mother had seen the Mothman while she was pregnant with uh, one of her siblings back in the, the late '60s, like the '68 or something like that. So that was cool. I need to get some. I've, I've I've got one lady who was one of the uh, original people that uh, said they saw a Mothman. Uh, Linda Sigmund, if you've heard of her, she's gonna come on for an interview. I need to schedule that with her. We we said we'd schedule it after the Mothman Festival. I guess I need to contact her in a couple of days. The lady that uh, runs the the Mothman 5K, her grandmother had a sighting that I have up that uh, she sent me. She said she's going to send me some more from people she knew. I, I should ask her. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's a shorter one, but it, it's still really cool. Basically, her grandma was washing dishes, and she uh, saw it walk by, and she uh, ran out and grabbed her kids and drug them in. Really cool. So I was going to say that um, Lauren Coleman said he was inspired to tell Jeff to go do the museum because of the success of the alien museum in Roswell, New Mexico, because oh, that was, yeah, I've been there. I don't know if I told you. Not, not sure. But that, that was, that was really big in the nineties. And so this was the early two thousands when the museum thing was popping up. So he was like, oh, I've seen the success of that. So you should do that here, you know, with the, the Mothman, West Virginia. So it seems to work out pretty cool. It you does. Know, they, they have the, have... uh, the, the Flatwood Museum is in there. The Bigfoot Museum and Sutton are really both starting to pick up too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this stuff's really starting to pick up. Yep, Pe people like their monsters. Go with the legend tripping. You know, you want to go mm -hmm. to the location and, and see where the people saw the thing, and then you know you want to learn about it. You want to have a place to go. That's the museum. And oftentimes it just starts off with someone selling T-shirts, and then eventually it's like, well, now mm -hmm. now it's got to be a full museum. Now it's got to be more. 
So it becomes a, a meeting place, a place where people can go there and chat and maybe share their sightings and stuff like that. So it just builds into this big community center, every, every like all these different and locations. It brings tourists in. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing. It it, it uh, makes job. It creates jobs for people in in these towns and brings in revenue to the town. It's it's great. Mm -hmm. and it's good for people to have a place to go and uh, you know share their sightings or learn about stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is the the Mothman statue. I mean, that's probably one of the most photographed things in the world, right there. No, um, it's on uh, YouTube twenty four seven. Yep. <laughs> Thanks to me. Yeah. The exact opposite of the real Mothman, just being filmed constantly. Yep. <laughs> and uh, that's from 2003. Bob Roach, I actually, have a, a mini statue that his. Oh, uh, you're you're right. Yeah, you've got one. I I got this from Jeff. I, I want one like what you have, but I got this one. He got from Bethesda, and he gave me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one's cool too. That's the yeah. Fallout 76 one. Yeah, it it, it doesn't look. I mean, yeah, it's definitely way different, but it's yeah. still really cool to have. Also, it's got the antenna. I don't know. The, the, that one doesn't have antenna. And mm -hmm. instead of arms, it's got an extra thing of wings. Yep. It's got the wings spread out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the original witnesses didn't say the Mothman had arms, so maybe a little bit more accurate there. Yeah, it's still, maybe. Still very moth-like. Yeah. So, yeah, they got the, the statue and all that sort of thing. I remember when the Flatwoods monster didn't have the museum yet because it was still like a. Yeah, that museum's actually kind of new. I think it uh, was 2018. I think he told me he opened it up. He he also had it in like a. Uh, it was a kind of similar type thing as Jeff. He you know he's selling T-shirts and a couple other things at uh, a visitor center somewhere else in Sutton, mm -hmm. and uh, it just kept doing better and better. And then the. Uh, it's still the visitor center for uh, Sutton, but it's mostly the Flatwoods Monster Museum now. And it, I've got a video tour of it. And it, have you been to it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's it's, it's real. It's really cool. There is Bigfoot Museum's cool too. But yeah, it started off with uh, Andrew Smith with the uh, visitor center, and he had like a a shelf for the Flatwoods Monster. Yeah. And he had uh, that lantern, which was like a an old thing. Oh, that lantern! Should I? I could pull it up real quick. If you want to show it for the video, yeah, go for it. Hopefully, I don't drop it. Apparently, or or at least he told me, there's two. They lost the original molding for this. This one is slightly shorter than mm -hmm. the uh, newer ones. Yep. But yeah, I just stick a light bulb underneath there, and it it shines out. It's it's really cool. I love this lantern. I've got two. I've got the newer one too, but it's down in the basement in case my kids ever break it. That's back from the the 70s when they were doing like a fundraiser and stuff. Uh, the, the fella who made the lantern, I remember his name is uh, John Gibson. He made that for the Braxton County Chamber of Commerce for fundraising. Oh, cool. I think that they started making those again when people were interested in Gray Barker and for the Barker archive. And hmm. then, uh, then I guess it's when it started getting make, made again, people would travel down to Flatwoods to buy one. I, I remember doing that. That's what I did. I went down to Sutton to like the Sunoco gas station where they sold them. That was the only place you could get them. Uh, I bought one of those. And I guess Andrew had the other center there where he had that on, a, on the shelf. But there's the chairs. They, they had those before. They had the museum, those big oh. flatwoods monster chairs. Yeah, we did a video uh, where we tracked down all the chairs. I don't know if you saw that. Nope, I've done that as well. It's a fun thing that, to do. It's, it's a fun thing to do, yeah. Um, got lost a couple times. <laughs> People like that one too. Yeah, so so when I went uh, adventuring, legend tripping for the flatwoods monster, it was going to buy the lantern and then the chairs and stuff. But now they have the full museum there in Sutton, so it's really cool. You can just go there to buy the lanterns now. Yeah, I got I got mine at the spot, but I don't know if the museum was. I can't remember when it was, but I got it at the spot. Oh, yeah, I've been there it too. Was twenty. It might have been twenty eighteen. Um, we were coming back from uh, actually the 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 Mothman Festival, and uh, we stopped and got something to eat. They had it for sale there, and I grabbed one. I was like, oh, that's cool. So I think I went the first time to Sutton and to Flatwoods in uh, 2016. And then, yeah, they had that stuff in like 2018, the Flatwoods Museum. Yeah, they had the the classic sign, though. That's that's always been there, the, the home of the green yeah, monster. The green monster, yep. They had mm -hmm. that when I went the first time. And then there's um, there was like a billboard outside the spot, which is that little restaurant, the spot. Yeah, you know, they were talking yeah, about. Yeah, with the photo op, that one's really cool. 
Mm -hmm. I think I got Best Virginian to get in it when we met. The, oh yeah, the 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 chairs video. I I, I met Best Virginian in person. And oh yeah, that that was your collab for that collaboration video. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. The Grafton monster. It's interesting. That's uh, there was a sign that they made. They eventually got stolen. Just as the Grafton monster, and uh, that's they had that sign out there where the location was where uh, Rubber Cockroll supposedly saw the creature on the roadside. That sign now sits above a coffee shop called Espresso Yourself that has Grafton Monster T-shirts. So, oh, that's you, cool. You see, it's slowly building again. I heard that they have a Grafton Monster Day now, hmm. and they have someone uh, dressed up as the Grafton Monster. But it's like next weekend, and I, I've just been to so many things this summer. I'm just exhausted, you know. So I, I don't think yeah. I'll go. But that would be something interesting to go to one day. I'd like to go. I've never been to Grafton. It's uh, the birthplace of Mother's Day. Yep. It's pretty cool. It, that's where the uh, state cemetery is, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I've been to the little church where the Mother's Day thing first happened. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So you can see some stuff start to build there, too. You know, you have the, the Mothman Festival, the Flywoods Festival. I mean, not every Mothman Festival, <laughs> but, you know, it's a little bit of something. I think that the sign is good enough and the little coffee shop is good because I think that um, people could go there and talk about sightings, you know, as long as you have somewhere to meet, I guess, you know, you know, as long as there's some community building around it, it's, it's cool. There's the, uh, the reports, the, the, the writing that Gray Barker did because the, the Grafton monster was kind of buried in, in the archives for a bit. It happened in 64 and there was the two newspaper reports about it in the Grafton Sentinel, uh, which is um, the mountain statesman. The person who saw the Grafton monster, Robert Cockrell, was actually a newspaper reporter for that paper that's right and uh you know his fellow journalists didn't want to print his story but they they did you know because there were monster hunters looking out for the monster after people got word yeah that the sighting happened which tends to happen you know that happened with mothman everyone goes out looking for the monster and that was monster you know the t interior was bumper to bumper everyone looking for the the monster mm -hmm. um yes yeah, so there were monster hunters and they wrote a little bit about that and they they basically were kind of dismissive like oh teenage monster hunters look for for a creature you know they wrote two of those stories, and then it kind of went away. Uh, he talked to Gray Barker and told his story. Gray Barker wrote an article about it, but he never had it published anywhere. And so it kind of just hid in the archives for years and years. And then in, I think, 1990, Mark Hall, who's a researcher, discovered it in the Barker archives and like brought attention to it. And now people can see uh, Robert Cockrell's uh, oh, writing, cool. yeah, writing about the sighting, and then Gray Barker's little article about the sighting. So now you have, so that's really what the data is, is two newspaper reports, Robert Cockrell's handwritten thing that he sent to Gray Barker, and then Gray Barker's unpublished article. So that's, that's the only information there is about, about that. And for, you know, for a while, it was just those newspaper reports that people weren't you know, looking at. Because people have monster sightings, and sometimes those happen in small towns, and they kind of get forgotten about. You know, they kind of just go away. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that could have happened to Mothman if uh, it wasn't for people like Mary Heyer and John Keel, the people who wrote books about it and drew attention to it. Mm -hmm. Because Mary Heyer was there to like talk to all the witnesses and get more and more sightings and you know put her ear to the ground and see what's going on. She would collect uh, UFO sightings and Mothman sightings, and she was, you know, the the person to go to in town. And every town needs one of those people, the people to go mm -hmm. to with a if you've seen something strange. And she was definitely that person. And she would publish them in the Athens Messenger, really cool. And then when John Keel came to town, you know, they collaborated, and she was able to give him all the information he needed to write the book and to investigate and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, and that's kind of what we do, right, to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On people who've seen weird things, you want to, you know, mark it down and say this is important. It's kind of it's kind of neat if you think about it. We're collecting these stories from people, and uh, these stories might have been forgotten, but you know, now they they exist out there somewhere and may for it. I guess till Google pulls the plug on you and me, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really neat, I think. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. So, um I don't think I finished what we were saying before about uh, how you contacted me. You contacted me from the the wiki and things like that, and then uh -huh. you join you join the Discord. Yeah. And and back when I had a Twitter, we retweeted each other a bunch. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then I, I helped you with some of the the injured cold research and the veggie man research. Yeah. That was cool with my database there of information. And I linked yeah. back to you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we shared sightings. You you did a, a woman in white sighting on my website, and I did the UFO sighting on your channel or your website. Yeah. So uh, we we both like uh, the best Virginian. So where where did you first hear about him from? 
It came up in my recommended a couple years ago, actually. No, no. I know what it was. Um, when I first started out, Best Virginian started retweeting me out. A bunch of his followers started following me. He, you know, he helped get me out there when I first started. And now it's, I, I helped him get to a thousand subscribers. Like, I think I told you Spooky Appalachia's ballooned up. You know, just hit two two thousand last night, but uh, yeah, I share out his stuff and tell people to go check him out. And uh, he he was a couple away from a thousand. I, I was just like, hey guys, just just go subscribe. To him. I, I don't know. He had been around for a long time and just hit a thousand subscribers. He he's cool. He makes uh, good content. A lot of history stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, similar to your content, the casual looking around type stuff that, that I really enjoy. And yeah. yeah, a lot of photography and stuff and. Uh, his stuff is more, I guess, less paranormal. I guess his is more like yeah, he's based more about. yeah, he's more West Virginia and history and tourism, and then mine's kind of par paranormal themed. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're, you're spooky and I'm odd, and he's just West Virginian. So he focuses yeah, yeah. more on the history and the locations and things like that. Like he'll just yep. go to like a waterfall or to like a nice covered bridge and film the location. And you watch that, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. I reached out to him and uh, I think I emailed him and I also followed him on Twitter and retweeted a bunch. And then he joined my Discord at one point and that was cool. And so, yeah, we, we've had um, him and Micah and me did a, uh, a round table thing on my Yeah, YouTube I channel. saw that a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And we talked about spooky books and all that, folklore books. He's a big fan of Ruth Ann Music, who's a classic folklorist from West Virginia. She like taught classes and like collected folklore from her students. She has oh, a. That's cool. The, the Telltale Lilac Bush and Coffin Hollow. Those are her books. I've heard of Coffin Hollow. Mm -hmm. West Virginian likes to tell some of those stories on his channel and post them on Twitter and all that. And he, also, he, he actually gave me a book last time I, I ran into him. It was kind of neat. I forget what it was, but yeah. It's cool that you guys have uh, collaborated and met in, in person, though. That's really cool. Making connections, making friendships. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's really neat. And then uh, I, I met, I've met uh, Joe and Ron from Wild and Weird several times mm -hmm. now. Yep. They're I, they're really cool guys. I enjoy their content as well. They they joined my Discord at one point too. Um, they do a lot of like festival stuff. Yeah, I kept running into them at those. Mm -hmm. They organize some uh, conventions for themselves too. Yeah, they do. They they actually run the Flatwoods Monster Convention now. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and they have like wild and weird con, yep. stuff like that. They they do uh, some get togethers about like Sasquatch and stuff like that. It was yep. cool. And they actually caught some video of uh, something weird on a thermal on one of their last ones, which was kind of neat. Uh, I mentioned Micah. Uh, I know that you've used some of his his music for your videos, mm -hmm. and that's cool. Yeah, he makes. Now, I have not met him in person yet. Uh, we were at the festival at the same time this weekend and didn't realize it. He he actually did uh, a song for the uh, um, my John Henry uh, video where we flew a drone into the 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 Great Bend or is it King Bend? I, I, I can't uh, remember. Big Ben. Big Bend. Oh, coming. Big Bend is Great Bend next to it? I think. I think it's both names are. It's like oh, had the same it's name. Used thing. interchangeably. Okay. But yeah, we flew a drone into there. And we for a little ways and uh, we played some of Micah's music while it was flying in spooky uh synthesizer kind of stuff yep okay so i, I gotta ask you a difficult question uh what's your favorite monster of all the paranormal beings people are i like i feel like since i help at the museum i have to say mothman but if nobody from the museum's listening it's it's i think the flatwoods monster just looks cool mm -hmm. it's a really plus nice I, i'm closer to braxton county than than uh point pleasant i, I guess I think I had heard of Flatwoods Monster before Mothman, though, but hmm. that's just because I'm closer to it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah. It's, got, it's got a very unique sci-fi kind of design. It, 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 it does. I, it, I don't know. I just have always thought it looked so cool, and then just thinking about it, you know, floating around, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just really cool. And it's always just been the Flatwoods Monster or the Braxton County Monster, but recently they started calling it Braxy, kind of like, yep. ne like Nessie. From Loch Ness. Yep. I like the the Braxy name. Mm -hmm. It works. But I've I've had a bunch of people to like I say Braxy and they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying trying to give the creature a name since it like technically yeah. didn't have one. Yeah. So so I was gonna ask this. This would be a might be a bit of a rabbit hole. But uh, okay. what got what got you into the paranormal? 
I was good. I was thinking you were going to ask me that. So when I, I don't know which one came first. I think I told you I had a possible UFO sighting when I, I, I haven't sent it in to you. I, I can though. When I was a kid in elementary school, uh, I was on the swings on the playground and um, I'm in the New River Valley. So there's mountains, all, we're, we're in a valley, there's mountains all around us. On one of the mountains, I saw just that, like a, 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 a sphere, a round sphere, just sitting there. And I'm like, what is that? It was, it was reflective, kind of. You could see the sun reflecting off of it. I'm like, what on earth is that? I, I got one of my friends, and they didn't know what it was either. Before I know it, the whole class is looking at it, and then the two or three teachers are coming over and one runs over with binoculars looking at it and we all look at it through the binoculars and nobody knows what it was and what always got me was that the teachers were really confused by it and uh, I remember it, it didn't move it never moved there was no sound then I was getting on the bus at the end of the day I looked back and the, the, the thing wasn't there I don't know what it was but uh, and I think Around the, uh, also around that time, I, I, I lived with my grandparents, and um, my grandfather was really into um, unsolved mysteries, and I saw a lot of interesting stories on there, and one of those two things, I don't know which one came first, got me, I, I checked out all the, uh, the paranormal books in uh, the library and started reading them, and um, I was all... Like, I'm still fascinated by, by stories today. I was just fascinated by all these uh, stories of Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, um, cryptids. I was really fascinated with Bigfoot and uh, Nessie. And then I found out about uh, Braxy and Flatwoods Monster that were close. I was like, oh, man, that, that was just a couple of hours from here. I remember thinking that. And um, I've always been pretty interested in all this stuff ever since. I've always thought it was cool. Uh, I've never done any kind of paranormal investigation or anything. I I don't know that. I, that I mean, I'm not knocking it if anybody's into it listening, but uh, it's just not my cup of tea. But I, I've just been fascinated with the stories uh, my whole life, and I I've had a couple possible sightings myself. I won't say it's paranormal for sure, but. Um, I've seen a couple of things I can't explain. Yeah, so, some people get interested just from like, you know, reading a book, or they mm -hmm. just like like folklore and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then some some people have a a sighting or some kind of inciting incident that that brings them to be interested in the paranormal. So that that's cool that you had a a, a UFO sighting. Mm -hmm. And then I, I I think I told you. I, oh gosh, here recently I had something very weird happen while I was doing one of the. Uh, what did, what, did, what did you call it the uh the the where I go to the the places I actually should write that down it's actually really good the uh, legend tripping legend tripping I was with the owner of the place and something weird happened uh it was just the three of us there we were in the basement of this of the the college hill hospital and we heard a lady screaming isn't that weird no that's crazy it's crazy I mean there there's it's possible that the, there's something that could explain it but gosh that's so weird. But yeah, I've had a couple of weird things happen here and there. They're they're fun little stories, but you know they could also be explained possibly too. Yeah, I, I was gonna say with the uh, the UFO sighting that you were talking about, Jalen Hynek, who's a, a classic UFO researcher. I was just looking up his thing before about um, his different classifications for UFOs, and he was saying that there's the what he calls the night lights, which are people who see little lights in the sky at nighttime. And I like he what said, you saw. Yeah, and then there are the daytime discs, where people see, like, discs and saucers in the daytime. So I think it's mm -hmm. interesting that people see, like, lights nighttime, and then the daytime they see discs. And that sounds like something similar to what you saw. And then, uh, then it goes on to the close encounters. So there's a close encounter of the first kind, where you see the saucer at close range, or see the, the object at close range. And then close encounter of the second kind, which is where it leaves some kind of trace evidence, like uh, broken leaves, broken stuff, uh, saucer nests, or crop circles, or car stalling, engines, all that sort of thing, any kind of like mm -hmm. what they call trace evidence. And then a close encounter of the third kind is where you see the actual being, like the being who is piling the ship comes down or something like that. So that's the close encounter of the third kind is where you get that classic term from. And the close encounter of the fourth kind is alien abduction. So there you go. 
That's the different uh, classifications. It makes some sense, some relative sense. Yeah, you can never. No, I think the the UFO. St I guess because I, I I saw my whole class saw what we thought was a UFO. I mean, I I was looking into Betty and Barney Hill type stories. I was reading mm -hmm. about those, and I was so creeped out by it. Oh my gosh! And I still to this day like to get creeped out. That's another thing I like about these stories. They're it's like ooh, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. B Betty and Barney Hill. That's the that's the classic. Oh gosh, that one that one creeped me out for for a long time too I, I think i lost some sleep as a kid over that one mm -hmm. Cla the classic grays and the uh abduction stuff uh mm -hmm. their their testimony was actually uh uncovered by hypnosis which is a yep. fascinating thing they they said they just saw the saucer and then they uh i think it was betty was having dreams about it afterwards and then they went to the therapist and they went under hypnosis and that's when the the actual abduction story came out the book is titled uh an interrupted journey that's uh, one of the early classic grays, the gray aliens with the big bulbous heads and black eyes. Oh, I saw the the illustrations from it as a kid. Oh man, that creeped me out. They had like the 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 big head and the angry looking black eyes. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Did you ever watch uh, Fire in the Sky? Sounds familiar. Uh, that's the Travis Walton story. Is that the uh, the uh, lumberjacks? Yes. Yes, yes. Yep, yep. I, I've heard of that. It's another... Uh, I think I've seen that. That's another big classic one, yeah. Another abduction story with the Greys. That team went missing for a couple of days, I think it was, and they they um, accused his friends of, uh, I think it was murder, because he was missing. And then he showed up, he, he called and showed up, and they, they were cleared. Mm -hmm. So did you uh, read a lot of, like, the old books in the library about like folklore and ufos and stuff like that mm. and then and you said you watched like uh, unsolved mysteries and probably some of the tv spots and documentaries. and into the x files a little later on it scared me too much when i was a kid so it was mostly books until i was a teenager what uh, what decade would this have been in uh that was the late 90s I believe. okay yeah that makes sense that's when that stuff really got big on tv and stuff like that and that's mm -hmm. when like the roswell museum opened up and the grays mm. and the abductees were a big thing yeah, a lot of the Sasquatch stuff uh, in the media stuff got, got popular in like the 70s. That's when like the, the golden age for like Sasquatch media and those scary stories and Boggy Creek and all that sort of thing. There was uh, that show In Search Of, with Leonard Nimoy. That was another one. Oh, yeah, that's a cool little show. And then yep. there was the time uh, 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 when I was a kid, I, I thought I saw Bigfoot out in our woods, but it was probably just a bear, which uh, I'm actually lucky to survive that, but. I could tell you how it went down if you want, but it, I'm pretty sure it was a bear. Yeah, go for it. I, okay. I'd be interested to hear that. I, I uh, wandered around in the woods a lot as a kid, mm -hmm. and uh, I had my dog with me. We came upon this uh, big thing laying down, big furry thing in the woods. It was pretty far from the house, actually. And uh, it was laying there, and it started moving, and then... I screamed and took off running the dog. I don't know what caused it to run back with me, but eventually it ran back with me. We ran back in the house and didn't go back out and didn't see anything. Um, it's It started getting up, but I only saw its backside and it was brown. And I always thought it was Bigfoot because we don't have brown bears around here. But I found out later in life that the uh, black bears can have kind of brownish fur. So I'm pretty sure that's what it actually was. I always thought it was neat until I got older and looked into it. Mm -hmm. What age were you at this time? Almost ten. It was all. It was around the same time as the the, the UFO thing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what year the UFO thing was? I don't. I think it was. I, my best guess was between ninety seven and, and ninety nine, because mm -hmm. I was still in elementary school. That's cool. Have you had uh, many other paranormal experiences? I know you had the, the woman in white one recently. Yeah, there was that. And then there was my, uh, I took over my grandparents' house in college, uh, their their townhouse. And uh, two of my friends lived with me. And um, there was strange stuff that happened around that house um, that we couldn't explain. Um, like things would go missing. You know, that's actually kind of common anyway, but, uh, stuff would go missing. The door to the basement would, uh, lock all the time. Like it, it was a garage basement and you would pull into the, uh, 
garage or outside the garage and that's how we always got into the house you you did laundry down there too you'd be down there doing laundry or you would be coming in the house and that would just lock and we would get into arguments why'd you lock that door i was like dude i didn't we started keeping uh the key to it uh underneath the mat down there because it locked so often and then we would hear what sounded like footsteps coming up those steps at night and then one time well actually twice it was twice that uh we had a a deck and uh there was a big i think nine to twelve foot tall uh fence kind of around that part of the yard so stuff couldn't get in easily you know and uh there was banging and and the the uh doorknob was turning this happened twice and um we 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 had no idea how it could have happened, so that was very strange. And then we we would smell some weird smells and stuff, just a just a, a lot of random weird stuff. I had sleep paralysis one time, but you know that that's also explainable. But uh, yeah, we all we used to say, oh that that house was haunted. It was a townhouse, and we were in the middle of two other ones. And uh, as, while we lived there. The neighbors on both side of us, sides of us died in the houses. So we were like, yeah, maybe it's something with that. Who knows? Okay. Did you ever own any uh, items that were haunted? No, I I don't know if it's just my my family's religious upbringing that uh, I, I just think it, I, I want to stay away from that kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Other than that location, was there any other uh, places that you lived or were in that were haunted you think or there could have been um there was my parents house my parents old house our 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 great grandmother my mom's grandma lived with us she had just passed away uh my sister was sick and she went to the drugstore up the road to get her medicine her prescription filled and left my sister there home alone, and she heard on the radio there was a bank robbery not too far from our house, and she she's flipping out because she left the door unlocked. She's racing home. She gets home. The door's locked. My sister's asleep in bed, and there's the smell of my great-grandmother's perfume right next to the door. I, I always thought that one was cool. I need to run it on Spooky Appalachia one day. Yeah. I think I've I've heard a few stories of like, you know, uh, ghost apparitions where people smell a certain smell or something like that mm-hmm. that reminds them of the person, you know, yeah. in perfume and or flowers or something like that. So it seems to be a, a trope in those kinds of stories. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I appreciate by the way your your skepticism. It's, it's a good attitude to have for a researcher. You're always like, could this have been that? Could this? You're always looking for like a logical explanation. So I appreciate that kind of attitude. Oh, thanks. That's good for investigating. What about uh, psychics? Have you ever had like any psychic things or anyone who you thought was psychic? No, I, I've just never really been into the whole psychic thing. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying it's real or fake. It's just it's been one that hasn't really interested me. And there's I've heard people talk that there's just never been any psychics in my area. So I don't hmm. know. Maybe that's something to do with it. It's just, uh, I don't know. Yep. Or like uh, ESP, extrasensory perception kind of thing. Like I've, yeah, I've heard of it. I've actually had a I had a dream or two. My my dad used to jokingly say I had ESP. Like I had a dream gr- growing up about my aunt, and then woke up to my dad talking on the phone that my aunt had to be rushed to the hospital in the middle of the night when I was a kid, uh, and she had a appendicitis. But you know, it could have just been I, I was having a dream. You know, I heard. I was asleep and my dad was talking about the aunt and uh, caused me to have a dream. That's possible too. Yep. Classic paranormal thing is, you know, dreams that come true or prophetic dreams and things like that. But yeah, as you said, there is always the, the more logical explanation that, that could be more accurate. What about uh, the more folkloric stuff like folklore creatures, uh, fairies, will-o'-wisps, goblins, gnomes, all that sort of thing? I'm really into the will-o'-wisps because uh, people have sent me a lot of stories Fairies you don't hear a lot about around here. I don't know. I haven't. I don't know if you have. Hmm. Well, I study uh, like old folklore and stuff like that, and it's oh, that, connection. It's connection. I mean, to yeah, UFOs. I think it, I do. I did have a garden gnome. My sister stole it 
we had another one, and my dog tore it up. I haven't looked into those a ton, but I have will-o'-wisps because I don't, I don't know why. I just think those are really interesting. Mm-hmm. And it, they've been caught on camera, even, if you've looked around on YouTube and seen some videos. And uh, have you heard of the Brown Mountain Lights? Yes, the classic Appalachian thing. Or yeah, UFO. My, I know someone that's seen the Brown Mountain Lights. I, I always in my head have thought of that as the will o wisp mm-hmm. and I know someone who's seen the Mason County lights, which is another one. Mm-hmm. There's a, a bit of a connection there between like, you know, light anomalies that could be either interpreted as a UFO or interpreted as a fairy or will o wisp or things like that. Or, you know, people see them in a haunted house, they'd be like, it's a, it's a ghost light, things like that. So yeah, yeah, people just yeah see I've it. always found, yeah, I've always found the ghost lights really interesting. Mm-hmm. People just see strange lights sometimes. And I guess depending on the context, you could see them in different ways. But yeah, I always found that fascinating. So, and also with um, the classic folklore and like fairy lore and some of the, the Celtic stuff, you can see some similarities with uh, UFO lore because some of the stuff is, uh, you know, there's like the Kentucky Goblins. And those are, are goblins. Yes, yes. Goblin. Oh, I did not connect the dots on that one. That, that's another really interesting case that mm. I need to do one day, <laughs> you know. Mm. Yeah, and then the uh, the early... Uh, 1955 Loveland, Ohio thing, which is sometimes called the Loveland Frogs, yes. was, was also called the the Gnome Men. So they because they described them as like a gnome. Yeah, so there, there were was, three of them, right? Yeah, and they had wands. They held above All their heads. Right, you're right. You're right. I forgot that. Yeah, so th- those are considered like UFO tales. But if you think about them, it's like okay, you got goblins, you got gnomes. You know, it's kind of like the classic yeah. classic folklore stuff. You're right. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Yep. If you think about it, UFOs, just kind of like a, a modern update on that kind of old school folklore. Just I, add yeah, a, I'd heard that before, yeah. Just add a flying saucer in there. Yep. Yeah, I like the fairy lore stuff. It's, it's interesting. Because sometimes people had stories about like they went to the fairy realm, and nowadays people would say, oh, I went to Venus or Mars or whatever, you know, or Lanyolus. You're right. Yeah, it just could have been, uh, that's how they, uh, they, they, they comprehended it back then, because they, they didn't know about that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep, and and before you had uh, the UFOs, there were like phantom dirigibles, with these mysterious men and flying dirigibles. So there was stuff like that. Folklore just kind of changes and evolves over time. Um, uh, we were talking about legend tripping before. I was actually researching uh, something from Kentucky uh, a little bit, or re familiarizing myself with something. The the Popelik monster is a oh yeah, it's like a goat creature in uh, Kentucky. I was thinking about yeah. that. I was thinking about how that is like probably one of the most dangerous legend tripping things there is. Because people go out there to those trestles and they get hurt and they get killed. So, unfortunately, kind of... yeah. Um, I actually have two followers that uh, that that live there and have been hearing about that uh, most of their life growing up. Yeah. Yep. So that's like the the dark side of legend tripping. You know. The, yeah, the, it is. Yeah. The the fun side is you go somewhere and it's you know it's not private property and you can go there and you can check it out and see what it looks like and what the people saw. And then the the dark side is like. Being lured onto yeah. train vessels, they're dangerous. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I've heard a of a couple people that uh, met their end on uh, that particular one. But uh, I think you know maybe with drones and that t- kind of stuff might help with the, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, send a drone up instead. Yeah, there, there are other dangers of like going into a forest and you get lost, or you know, going into a tea interior and get hurt, something like that. Always a little bit of danger there with the legend tripping, but that one I think goes way too far. And you know, people oh, like to definitely, definitely. People like to go out to, to spooky graveyards in the middle of the night, that sort of thing. I, I did West that. West Virginia actually does that. Mm-hmm. I, I did that on Halloween one night, went out in the middle of the night, uh, at midnight to a spooky graveyard. Ooh. That was fun. Legend tripping is a social phenomena. It's, it's uh, common in, in folklore tales, which is an interesting thing. That you know, like, okay, this person who said they saw a monster or an alien, you know, the person is real, the location is real, you just don't know if the monster is real. And so you want to learn about the person and you want to maybe go to the location. And people think, you know, I think in the back of their mind, they think that maybe if I show up, then the monster will show up, you know, like yeah. in the back of your mind. It's like a weird thing. Okay. It's like, well, why would it you know, happen in 1952? Like, but if I show up, then of course it's going to come out, you know, it's like, why would that work? But yeah, it's some kind of thing in the mind. And people always try to figure out, like, how do you trigger a paranormal experience? How, how do you make it happen? You know, mm-hmm. people always try to have them. And, you know, they, they want to see a UFO. They want to see a Sasquatch. They want to see things like that. You know, it's it's interesting how to get the conditions proper for such things to occur. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you got to be there at nighttime. You got to be there at this time. You got to do this, you know. And not have your phone in your hand to be able to record it. 
I yes. mean, that's what that's what happened to me with the the possible woman in white. I, I was I was driving. My phone was in the passenger seat, and then I drove. I think I told you I drove off. I was like, "Well, dang! I wish I would have recorded that." Mm -hmm. You could go into detail on that story if you want. Oh yeah, I was. Uh, I got. Um, it was during the COVID lockdown. Um, I was working from home. Uh, it was still, I think, winter possibly. So it may have been early April. And uh, I got called to go into work basically to uh, turn something on. I was driving in. It was like really early, maybe 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm at a stoplight uh, across from a park. The park is completely flat. That whole area is flat. You can see for a mile probably. All around, like all around to a mile. Then it goes over to the New River. I see this lady in this kind of weird outfit because it's cold and it's rainy and it's dark and she was wearing like a, a, a like a paper thin dress and she had like a, like a kind of tiara looking thing that was made out of leaves i don't know what that's called it's some kind of outfit i, I, I don't know I, like I, I can think of it in my head and i've seen it before anyway she's walking down to the park no umbrella either no flashlight She's walking into the park. I'm like, well, that's weird. Here it is in the middle of a dang COVID lockdown, night, raining. That, that, that's, that's so strange. And then I think I looked back up at the light. It was green. So I started driving off, and I was like, and then I looked back, and she was gone. Completely gone. And, and, and I, I was like, that is so weird. I mean, where where could she have gone, you know? But yeah, that that was a strange one. That was very strange. Now, could it have been a woman in white? Possibly. Also, um, I found out later there's the bridge that goes over the New River, and uh, there there've been several people that have jumped off that bridge. So it's maybe that area is haunted. I I can't think of an explanation though of where she could have gone is the 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 only thing mm -hmm. which. Makes, and there were no other cars, so nobody picked her up. Very strange. Um, I was going to say, it reminded me of, uh, the Mothman, of a Mothman story from November 1967 that uh, was four male hunters encountered a large gray figure with red eyes, and uh, they were so frightened, they didn't think to use their rifles until it was gone. <laughs> so I like that. So they, they see the... Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it was exactly like that. Yeah, they didn't see... think about it. They, they see this Mothman creature type thing, and then they only when it's gone, they wait a minute. We, we've got guns. <laughs> we could have done something. Yeah. Yeah, so it was exactly like that. I was like, wait a minute. I had a phone. I could have filmed that. Yeah. So I wonder about things like that. Like if it could be like the paranormal entity is like influencing you, you know, in hypnotic ways or some kind of thing like that. To be like, awesome. okay, like don't pick up the camera. Like don't pick up the gun. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting thing. So a, a lot of people had... Uh, weird experiences during 2020 and during lockdowns stuff like that people mm. had you know people suddenly realizing that their their house might be haunted or i guess they you know they're bored and they go on a hiking trail and they see a sasquatch and all that sort of thing um mm. so yeah i made i made an article about that called the spirits of 2020 or spirits of lockdown 2020 it's basically about uh, the parallel experiences of people in the discord who were uh locked down for 2020 and things that i knew so there you go it's a fascinating thing and if your your addition was was very very nice for that you know adding the ghostly stuff so do, do you have any, any other stories you want to tell? Paranormal, I guess you, you talked monsters, spirits, UFOs, psychic phenomena. I think I've talked about everything. What about uh, religious apparitions? You said you grew up religious. Is there anything like that? No. I, I kind of, I probably won't go too much into it, but I kind of, our, our family kind of shifted away from the, like my, my grandparents were super religious, but we, we kind of shipped the, shifted away after just some drama and every church we went to, we just kind of, kind of dropped it. Like my parents and, and I, I just stopped going just because every church we ever went to was just so full of drama, you know, but not, I mean, you know, like probably around the time that uh, maybe that stuff happened when I was about 10 years old or so. Yeah. I stopped going. I've never had any kind of religious experience, though. Hmm. That's interesting timing, you know? Yeah, you, it is kind of, actually. I never really thought of that. Anyway, so um, my family's got the, the classic folklore, superstitious uh, 
folk practices kind of stuff. Do your family have anything like that? My grandma, um, her great-grandma that lived with her uh, was really into that stuff. She was alive during, uh, she was a Civil War widow, I think. My grandma's great-grandma. And my grandma would mention some of these, the, these, my, okay, my interpretation of folk magic was like the, the little things like, uh, throw salt over your shoulder. If, what is it, uh, you throw your salt over your shoulder for? I can't remember. If you what the, spill the salt over yes. your left shoulder. That, that's like those little sayings and things. That's my interpretation of folk magic. Yours could be different, but that's what I've always thought of it as, is those little things. Yeah, so people call those like superstitions. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's just whatever. You know, folk practice, folk magic, superstitions. E- either way. So wait, is that the same thing? I mean, I it, don't know. it depends. Oh, okay, yeah. Subjective. It's a subjective thing. But yeah, um, we have uh, like there. You do like a pendulum over a pregnant woman's belly to know if it's a if the baby will be a boy or a girl. Yeah, I've I've heard a bunch of these over my lifetime, and I wish I I had written them down or something. I mean, I still got that opportunity, I suppose. You know, my grandma is still around. That's, that's something really neat I should do, actually. I interviewed my mom recently. I have a video. It's my most recent video on my channel is uh, talking with my mom all about folk practices. I you know, may so, have listened to that. So, But you never did like a, a pendulum thing or anything to, to see I, if I've a... probably tried these these things at some point in my life, and I've, I've thought it was interesting. I'd I just can't, for the life of me right now, remember any of them. But I've I've mm-hmm. I'd, I've tried a, several of them. I know I have. I, I remember doing it. Mm-hmm. Like never leave a swing swinging or a rocking chair rocking. The spirit will come and sit down. Um, like there's one. It, it, it's like don't sleep with your head to the door. Have you heard that one? Nope. That's interesting. That's one I heard. It was like don't sleep with your head facing the door, or like a, a spirit will come and take you away it's either i'm pretty sure it's your head like don't have a, a welcome mat we will invite the spirits in yes classic ones like that uh the person yes. who, who opens a pocket knife must be the one to close it it's a, a classic one i've heard that one yeah i've heard that one uh, if you talk about your dream before you eat breakfast it will come true that was kind of that one too yeah uh there was a thing about like if you use someone else's crutches or their wheelchairs then it will like misfortune will befall you like it's you know like a kind of like tempting fate thing oh no i hadn't heard that one that was interesting um, if you're born with a, a call, like a layer of skin over your eyes, then you will see things others can't. Like mm. a mystical one. My, uh, I think it would be my great grandma had one of those, like skin over her eyes when she was born that oh. be removed. So it's like a, it's a mystical thing. You know, they say huh. that you'll see things. Oh, there's the white deer. We both talked about that one. Oh yeah. Once because I saw the albino. It's it's like a it's it's good luck or fortune if you mm-hmm. see an albino stag, stag or deer. Mm-hmm. That, I forgot about a, that. That was another one. Yeah. You posted photos of it in the Discord when you first saw it, and then you saw it again. Uh-huh. I think you said that was when you were doing, you were going through, like, throat surgery or something like that? Yes. I was about to have uh, thyroid, like, like the, the, the worry was I had uh, thyroid cancer, and uh, I saw that right before surgery, and, um, well, my thyroid was going to explode, basically. The surgery went okay, and I didn't have cancer. Okay. Well, that's pretty cool, then. Maybe it was a, you know, good sign. Like, here you go. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, that was very weird timing. It was just like a couple of days before. That's pretty cool. Another one is if you're born with two crowns on, on the head, like, you know, like the crown of the head, that means you'll be intelligent or lucky. That's a classic one. Hmm, I haven't heard like, that one. Uh, here's the classic ones of like, if you get chills, someone's walking on your grave, your ears turn red, someone's ears, talking about you. The, the ears red or the ears ringing. If your ears are ringing, someone's talking about you. I heard that's one I've heard. Mm-hmm classic um the old the 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 older people around here say their bones ache when it's about to rain or snow yep that's another yep. one my knees acting up it's gonna rain something like that mm-hmm. uh if mm-hmm. you're if your right hand itches you'll either get money or shake hands with a stranger that's i've heard that one uh if you kill a granddaddy long leg it will rain that's another one and then the uh the the woolly worms if the if you see a white one that's going to be a bad winter hmm that's interesting. Yeah. If you if you hit someone with a broom, one of you will go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wild one. Like if you're like sweeping something with a broom and you like hit them or their foot or something like that, one of you will go to jail. Wow. 
I'd heard I had I'd heard one one about uh, not sweeping out something about don't sweep outside with a broom. I don't know if that rings any bells. Uh, I've I've heard that one, but um, okay. never walk around with one shoe on, one shoe off. Socks too. I hadn't heard that one. There's a bunch of these. That's probably not. Yeah, they, they they make a good video for sure. Mm -hmm. Have you ever done like uh, dowsing rods where you try to find water, or have you want to do that? Yeah, I've done that before. I was something my grandma told me about once uh, that uh, you could use dowsing rods to uh, either find uh, spirits or water or something. And I was trying to, I think I was trying to find water, but I had, she had two rod, two of the rods and I, I was just out in the yard messing with them. I, I'd done it a couple times. I don't know if she still has them. Before they had like the, the copper rods, before they had those, they had the, like a, just an actual branch. And it was like two pronged branches. <laughs> sticks like branches yeah and then it would like it'd be like a, a piece of a branch where it's got two prongs and then it would be connected in the center and it would dip up yep. or down dip up or down if it was found water i think i've seen that yeah and they they used to do that to try to to, to when they would dig a well they like to find pipes and stuff like that they do that now yep um did anyone of your family ever use like verses from the bible to do something interesting like to stop bleeding or something like that no no we, we never did that Okay, well, that's a that's a classic uh, Appalachian thing, to uh, either to talk the burn out of a wound or like heal people with like Bible verses. That was a, a classic thing. I've heard of people doing that, but I don't think my family's ever done that. Yeah, or, like cure warts or things like that. Yeah, I've heard of that. I'm trying to think, but I don't think they they've ever done anything like that. Uh, we we're talking about um, bridges and tunnels, so I could say it's the whole thing where you hold your breath when you cross one. Yep. I, I, we we brought that one up yesterday. We we went through two tunnels on uh, on the way to and from Point Pleasant, and I, I jokingly oh I, I did a video for the Patreon. I jokingly told uh, my buddy Donald we got out of the tunnel. I was like, "Would you would you wish for? Would you hold your breath?" And he said, "No." But uh, yeah, we that just came up yesterday. Hmm. I, I heard that uh, someone actually. Uh, passed out while doing that when they were driving, and so you got. Oh gosh! So that's another uh, superstition that could be dangerous. You gotta watch out. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And uh, there's uh, the classic ones: don't sit under a ladder, black cat across your path. Yes. Sort of yes. I still that... get creeped out when I I won't walk under a ladder. I, I get creeped out if I see a black cat there. And th then there was uh, breaking a mirror, seven years bad luck. That's another one. And there's a bunch of things to like ward off uh, either witches or vampires, like putting a broom in front of your door or like dropping rice or something like that. Uh, we had one that uh, it was like corn, uh, corn cobs and a wreath on your door kept. Uh, was it evil spirits away or witches? Uh, I remember growing up, we had uh, we had uh, corn cobs and a wreath on our front door at one time. Hmm. I don't know if you ever heard that one. Nope. Um, there's a lot of protection stuff. It's just like that seems to be the most common kind of uh, superstition is like, here, you wear this or you put this on or you do this, then it will protect you from the, from something bad. It's a common thing. Like probably to sell something back then or something. Yeah, or just for people to feel you know more protected in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. They're afraid of evil spirits and like that. Did um, you ever hear of one? Uh, don't walk over a, a, a person's grave or anything like that. That was yeah. bad luck. Okay. Kind of well, goes not, in line. Yeah. Not only was it bad luck, it was also, I guess, dis well, not guess, but no, it's kind of disrespectful. There's a lot of graveyard superstitions, like yeah, you don't turn around when you leave. You don't whistle in a graveyard. Don't watch as the first goes by. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any other uh, protection myths, like uh, you know, like horseshoes above the door? Like Horseshoes wasn't over the door. It was like having one hung up somewhere in your house. Mm -hmm. Gosh, what was that? I think it was salt. Yeah, you could put putting salt. down like a like a, a line of salt or something. It, mm -hmm. I don't remember it fully. Yeah, there's a lot of different things that people put in like entryways, like doors and windows. Mm -hmm. I think that one goes back to religion. With uh, Christ said, "My people are the salt of the earth," and so that's a classic thing there. Oh, okay. You could carve the things. Board. That okay. too, yes. You could carve things. You know anything? Um, a, a cross hanging up in the house or horseshoes. But yeah, okay, that's enough of the superstitions then. Um, I was gonna go back to to dreams. Do you have uh, like meaningful dreams or like spiritual dreams where you think like, oh, this is something you know paranormal? The, there was the one where I had sleep paralysis uh, when uh, at that old house. I fell asleep on the couch watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, so that could have possibly, you know, explained the whole thing. 
but I fell asleep on the couch, and I woke up, at least I thought I did, and there was a, a black figure with a top hat. Now, I'll note, I want to note here that I'd never heard of sha shadow figures or the uh, the hat man before this, but I saw the, the thing standing there in my doorway. It had kind of yellow eyes, just black figures standing there in my doorway staring at me, and I couldn't move. Oh, man, it freaked me out. Like, it was just staring at me. I couldn't move. It felt like an, an eternity. And then, like, I, I snapped and I was able to move. And I, I still, to this day, don't know if I was awake or dreaming. That's how sleep paralysis feels. Like, you're you're paralyzed, can't move, and but you still see the room around you. So it feels like uh -huh. you're still awake. So, yeah, so that... It was, ooh, I, I never want to have that again. It was pretty bad. Yeah, your, your, your body's still going into, like, REM sleep. It's like rapid eye movement. And so you're not like fully asleep yet. And so then you're kind of stuck in that state and then you get paralyzed. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting thing. Although, you know, people could still say, well, there may be still something paranormal about it. Maybe, you know, the, the paranormal well, entities take, take advantage of you in that state and they use that to, to, you know, taunt you or whatever. But there are cases where people are, you know, in their day-to-day -day life and have a paranormal experience where they're paralyzed and they suddenly can't move or, you know, they're like hypnotically entranced. And you that's see that. That's true. You see that with the Mothman sometimes. I was going to say uh, two more things about superstitions. Do you know about elderberry beads? Elder be elderberry beads? Yeah, like people use elderberry for different things, and one of them is like teething. You can like put them in around a necklace for teething. Yes, I've heard of that for teething, but that I think that was the... You know, and then uh, health benefits for elderberries, but I think that's all mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, do you know, I'm thinking of right now. You know anything else for, for teething? That's another classic folklore thing to do is to help people with teething i've heard of that and uh like a, a silver object like a spoon silver spoon hmm okay did, did your grandmother ever have like jars filled with things yes she had like these old old timey jars uh they were like big brown jars i don't remember exactly what was in it all hmm. i'm trying to remember now i don't know what was in those jars did she do, like, uh, folk remedies and have a bunch of, like, ingredients and things? Yes. Yeah, she still does that, too. She's got all these little remedies for stuff. Like, you hear about these granny witches, or at least I started hearing about them recently from YouTubers, but I, I guess you would kind of call her that. Uh, like, if you had a cold, drink a little bit of whiskey or something like that to, to clear up congestion or... Uh, there's something with coffee beans that uh, she told me to do one time or uh, something with circulation. I wish I could remember all this stuff, but you can never remember it in times like this. Mm -hmm. But she she ha is like, do this for this or this for this type things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably like healing and stuff, too. Yeah. OK. Like I when my kids were teething, she she. Uh, Told us to run uh, ice cubes on their gums and, and stuff like that. I don't know if that actually helped. Well, I recommend interviewing her about that kind of thing because, you know, that's another one of those things that seems normal to people like us here in Appalachia, mm -hmm. but other people from outside, like they've never heard anything like that. So they're like, oh, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, I've always thought that that kind of stuff was like I was in college and uh, I had a friend that had something going on. I was like, oh, I'll just do this. They're like, how did you know about that? You know, that, yeah, you're right. It's, it's true that, uh, that it does confuse people. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, smells like it's going to rain. And they're like, what? Oh, thing. yeah. And it, it does smell like, to me, I, I, I think I can actually smell that. And then um, people are are really confused by it. But, I mean, you know, it, it, it definitely smells like it's going to rain sometimes when, it, when it's about to rain. Or it, it just, you can feel it. Kind of like a spider sense almost, you know? <laughs> yep. Okay, so yeah, I definitely recommend inter interviewing your elders. I always, you know, harp on that for people to, to do that kind of thing. I like the elderly people, the, the old old folks. They got the wisdom. They they know all the stuff. They got all the folklore. And so, yeah, I always tell people yeah, to... Yeah, we need to keep that stuff alive. Mm -hmm. So I always recommend people to interview the old folks, you know, where they've seen a UFO or a Sasquatch, or they got some kind of old folklore story or old folk practices. You know, it's important mm -hmm. to keep that kind of stuff around, the, the wisdom and such. Mm-hmm. I think another question I had for you is about your, your room there. I see some Flatwood Monster stuff in your, your spooky Appalachia. I assume that your, your room is now very paranormal themed, which is pretty much what happened yeah. to me. So could you, could you talk a little bit about your, your space there? I like the wood panel. Oh, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, well, I showed you this. I got it from Jeff Wamsley. 
this, I think I, he he hands me a lot of stuff. This was also from the museum. This is only part of it too. And then I, I had the uh, the Flatwoods Monster Lantern. This came from a festival. I just thought it was really cool. It's uh, Braxty in the middle of uh, West Virginia. You know, Braxton County's in the middle of West Virginia. I thought that was so cool. I got it at a Bigfoot festival a long time ago. Mm. Um, somebody got this for for me for Christmas uh, a couple years ago. It's Mothman. It says Mothman Lives. It's a it's a metal thing. Also came from a festival. And that's the, the, the Flatwoods Monster poster. They they hand those out if you buy something at the Flatwoods Monster Museum. This is a big poster I did. I got I never mentioned this. About two years ago I got invited to uh there there's an Appalachian studies program at a at a college near me and they invited me to come come speak at that and I made this poster with a couple stories on it and talked about them. So that was that's, real neat. Yeah. That's, that's cool. I think you mentioned that in the Discord. That's really cool. I did. did. I probably did. And then I've got all kinds of books here. Uh, this is definitely not all of them. West Virginia Dark Tourism. Uh, I've got Jeff Lomsley's two books here. I, I don't know if these are the signed copies. Oh, they are. Uh, for Jimmy, thanks for all your help. Best wishes, Jeff Wamsley, 8-28-2021. Hmm. But that's uh, that's the one we were talking about, uh, the facts behind the legend. This is probably behind, yeah, behind Red Eyes. I've, I've got a signed copy of it. I think I put it up somewhere, though. Yeah, this isn't the signed copy. I've got it put up in a box, protected, like a pr- protective thing. Oh, Joe from Wild and Weird made me this one, the, the little Mothman. Actually, cool. he, he made me something else uh, at the festival. Oh, Withville, uh, this coin is from Withville, um, Withville uh, UFO Festival. I kind of shared out their stuff about the festival a bunch before and said I was going and it, uh, then a bunch of other people. This was in Withville, Virginia. Uh, back in the 80s, they had a wave of, a big wave of UFO sightings. And they have a festival there now. It's r- really cool. But uh, they gave me that coin because I helped them out, and I did. The, I judged the costume contest and stuff. It was really neat. I ran into them at the Mothman Festival too. The people that organize it. But yeah, that's just a couple things. I've got more somewhere. I think I'm looking around the room, but I don't see anything jumping out at me right now. But yeah, most of it's books, and I've got like a whole bookshelf full of books. I've got even more eBooks on on Kindle. I've been recently getting into that. You know, I usually had just the, the paper books. Yeah, but so I'm sure like with you, it just like starts off as one little tiny shelf and then it just grows and grows and takes over the, the whole the whole room. That's basically what happened with me. It's like I had like one little Mothman shelf. And it's kind of like what happened with those museums. You know, you turn your house into the museum. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what happened with me. And now my, I have my paranormal office with all the stuff. And I, have, I have little figures and just books and books and books. And I do have some of the wild and weird stuff. They're, they're figures from the, the festival. I have a little they UFO. Make really, Joe, Joe makes some really great uh, little figures. Mm-hmm. So I've got those. So yeah, that, I, I just asked because you have a camera. So I was like, well. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually my guests don't have cameras. So that was like, okay, talk about that. Because, you know, it's always cool to see people have their, their 40 in the lair, their, their uh, 40 in office. Have, have you ever heard the, the term 40 in before? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yes, I, I have. Okay. Are you, have you ever read Charles Forks? Are you familiar with like uh, what that means? I guess not. I, I, I've heard I've heard the term, but no, I have I I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't guess I know a hundred percent what it means, but I, I've heard it thrown around a lot. Yeah, it, it's just basically um the, the Charles Fort. He was the one who kind of coined a lot of what the paranormal is, and he was one of the progenitors of the movement who started assembling uh you know reports of anomalous phenomena and collecting it all together in his books and things like that. He would go to the library and just uh, pile up information on like from old medical journals and uh, scientific journals and things like that and uh, collect the oddities and the weirdness and the, the mm-hmm. things that were strange. And he called those anomalous phenomena. And he called it the, the data of the damned. And he collected those all together and put those out in books. And it's supposed to be like the stuff that science could explain. And so people who study things and collect odd reports and data 
are often called Fortians, and they, they self-identify as Fortians to say that they're in that same movement of Charles Ford who did that kind of thing. I yeah. think you referred to me as as that before too on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because because what you do is 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 like that. You collect the strange reports in the same way I do, so it makes you in that same tradition. Because you know he was one of the first people to uh, collect reports of lights in the sky long before they were called UFOs mm-hmm. and uh, out of place animals, out of place objects. So yeah, and also some some ghost stories, some psychic phenomena, things like that. All the stuff that we call paranormal in that genre was kind of carved out by him. Yeah, he he reported like uh, reports of like fish falling from the sky, and like frogs oh, falling yeah, in the sky. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of that report, and it may have been from from him. Yeah. Yeah. So classic stuff like that. So yeah, I use that term sometimes interchangeably with paranormal. So it's like a paranormal researcher, Fortean researcher, things like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, I was I was gonna say before uh, just to to reiterate, uh, you know, as, as a folklorist, as somebody who likes folklore, I, I always say to folks to to interview your elders. Cause that's where a lot of the folklore comes from. And so I was gonna say that you know. Not only you, but the the audience, anyone out there, mm-hmm. if you if you got some some old folks, ask them because they you you'll, you never know what they have until you, until you ask them. You never know what kind of strange experiences or or life experience they have until you ask them. And it goes more for even the paranormal, like people who have had uh, interesting lives. It's always important to kind of ask those questions and you know things mm-hmm. that sound mundane or things that sound normal. You never really know until you you dig into it, and people might find stuff like that interesting. So you know, document history, document folklore, things like that. Um, two, the two more things I have. One is, uh, I guess, recent stories you featured on your website, and what your plans, future plans for the for the project is. What are recent ones? I'm trying to think. Uh, mostly the recent ones. Um, I had forgot that I had a couple Mothman stories laying around, so mm-hmm. I featured uh, a bunch of Mothman uh, stories, and the location, the uh, festival video. I mean, really, the plan is just to keep on doing what I'm doing, you know. And uh, m- one hope is that it'll it'll uh, make some money, and I can go to some of the one into the, some of the ones that I, y- you have to pay to go into, and if it also if it makes some money, you know, better better equipment and that kind of thing. But yep. uh, that, but some hopes is to be able to go into some of the the famous ones like uh, the the state penitentiary. I have I haven't asked them, but uh, that that's one I'd like to go to. Um, what's the one the 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 asylum? Trans Allegheny. Yeah, I'd like to do them too. There, but uh, there's been a couple places I'd like to do. They told me I had to pay big bucks to do, and I mean it's kind of sad that I had to pay like couple hundred dollars to film a 30 minute video but i'd like to do some of those just because they're you know they're big historical ones that's that's some things i'd like to do Mm -hmm. i'd like to go to grafton i've never been to grafton i think it'd be cool to do a video in grafton yeah i want to head on down to the the town where the the veggie man thing was even though there's probably oh yeah there's nothing there for that so but it's there isn't just to go man I did the story on the Veggie Man, and I, so like ninety percent of the people said they had never heard of Veggie Man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, somewhat of an obscure one. It's another, it's another Gray Barker one. It comes from a, a pilot who told him that story, and it was it's featured very, very little bit in one of his books, and then it's in an article from him, and then it's in uh, Alien Meetings by Brad Steiger. So you know, it's not as publicized, but yeah, it's it's always shows up in. West Virginia art these days, when they have all the monsters together, you see the grafted monsters, the flywoods monsters, the moth, and they throw a veggie man in there because it's such a unique yep. creature. And yeah, it comes from from that fella, 1968, and that was uh, Jennings H. Frederick, north of Fairmont, near Grant Town, West Virginia. So that was uh, he was in the woods and he was hunting. So that one, yeah, just... he was hunting uh, woodchucks, if I remember yeah. right. Mm-hmm. With and a bow his and arrow. Mom had a uh, UFO and creature from a UFO sighting too, I think. Yes, that was featured and he in. He had Men yeah. in Black. Yes, afterwards, uh, you know, which which goes into like you know Gray Barker, who's very into the Men in Black, and you know his kind of trickery. So you kind of got to take that into account. Um, oh yeah. But uh, yeah, his his mother had like a, a a sighting of some like little devil-looking creature that came out of a flying saucer, and that story was in Passport to Magonia by Jacques Vallée in 1969, and then Frederick has his uh, experiences as well, so. And then, yeah, and then he tells Ray Barker, and then he has the, the Men in Black encounter where it's like they, they gasped him or something like that. Yep. Trent's like paralysis. Yeah, it was the, the, it was the only one that where, uh, where the, 
the person said that the men in black were wearing ski masks, I think. And uh, the veggie man was like hypnotic, had like hypnotic eyes. So once again, there's a hypnotic thing and it drew blood from yep. him. Yeah, it, it drew blood from him and its eyes changed colors or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's really nothing to, to go down there and, and see because it was in the woods somewhere. Be interesting just to see the town, I guess, and see like where, like you know, see if you could find like some wooded area and be like, oh, this this is a place where it maybe could have happened, or this is what it might have looked like in that general area, you know. But yeah, that's a that's a legend tripping thing that doesn't really have any anywhere to go with it. But it's a yeah, it's a mm -hmm. fun one just because of, of the uniqueness of it. I like to do a, a haunted house at some point soon. That'd be cool. Um, you know, get together with some people and go to a haunted house, or even just go in the woods looking for Sasquatch. I haven't I haven't done something like that in a while because of the pandemic and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That would be neat. My current project I'm working on, since you were talking about your current stuff, uh, my current project is a, a Fordian history book of sorts, where I've been like writing different chapters and it's this big chronological history from like oh, Charles wow. Fort, from like Charles Fort to modern day. So I've got the first two chapters done. The first one is like about Charles Fort, and his, his work was from like 1919 to 1930s. So that covered the whole uh, his whole uh, life and his thing where he had the, the Fortean Society and all the people who started becoming Fortians, and then it started influencing science fiction, because a lot of his um, ideas and theorizing got picked up by uh, science fiction writers as like fun ideas for stories. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, for example, he explained the idea of missing items and like items that showed up randomly. He explained them as uh, they teleported, so he coined the term teleportation, and yeah. so that's like famous in sci-fi. Yeah. So they just picked that up, and then after that, um, I have a chapter that I've written already about uh, Ray Palmer, and uh, he's a, 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 an early sci-fi writer who was in charge of Amazing Stories that became, it was like a pulp magazine that had the, the Schaefer mystery, which is about this guy named Richard Schaefer, who claimed to be in contact with these creatures who live underground called Deros, and you know, he's a, a very wild character with a wacky story. I've heard the name. Yeah, well, uh, Ray Palmer printed his story as as true as like this is a, a true story even though it was a very wild story and then that became a whole movement of the schaefer mystery and uh the science fiction community didn't like that very much and palmer got kicked out of the science fiction community and basically had to start his own kind of paranormal stuff and that's where the fate magazine came in so he founded fate magazine which you might have heard of which is a, mm -hmm. a big uh institution in the, in the paranormal field you know all the, all kinds of sightings or stories were first published there in fate magazine so it, it was one of the like kind of first of its kind for, for paranormal stories. And uh, that's where the Kenneth Arnold sighting of 1947 that coined the term flying saucer came from. That was in the first issue of Fate magazine. You know, they, they called Ray Palmer uh, the man who invented flying saucers and the, the man who killed science fiction <laughs> because the, the way he uh, turned amazing stories into the whole Schaefer mystery thing. So, yeah, I have those first two chapters done or the, those two chapters I, have to, I think i have to put another chapter in between about like mm -hmm. the loch ness monster and the yeti and like cryptozoology stuff that happened in the 30s and 20s but yeah after that we're going chronologically and i'm all the way up to the 50s now i'm writing a chapter currently where i'm going through the 50s and it's like this big long list of like all the flying saucer stuff all the the contactees and witnesses and yeah it's quite the the, the undertaking the, the endeavor to go through and chronologically go through all the stuff you know 52 is oh, the I'm year bad. 52 is the year I'm with with Flatwoods Monster, George Adams mm -hmm. E, all this stuff. I'd be a, that sounds sound like it'd be a pretty awesome book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I basically is uh, supposed to be like a, a Fortean history book, and I'm going chapter by chapter, but I'm p publishing on my website, so it's just like anyone can read oh, it and okay. do that. So I don't really want to publish it and make money from it and put it in a binding, so I'm just putting it on the website in chapter by chapter, and each chapter is like a blog post. So there you go. So cool. I'm working on that. That's, that's my current project that's taking up all my time. But yeah, at some point though. I want to do some some haunted house or stuff, or maybe go in the woods looking for Sasquatch. Um, another thing is we we're talking about the UFO bird, the Mothman. There was uh, two women, Brenda Stone, another woman, on May nineteenth, nineteen sixty-seven. They said they saw a winged creature that flew up to meet a UFO, and the, they explained there's a, a shadowy form, bright red lights, like glowing eyes, on top of a nearby tree, and a glowing red light which looked to be a luminous object. Then appeared and approached the tree. The shadowy figure rose up towards the red object, and vanished. So the, the creatures you saw flew into the object, into the, the light there. So I'd it's... heard something like that before. Um, I'd also heard uh, 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 like a, a, a Bigfoot coming out of a UFO uh, a report before. Mm -hmm. That's I don't a know lot. if you ever heard that. Yeah, there's a lot of that. In uh, Stan Gordon's book, you know, in his, his work, Stan Gordon, he's a 
researches the Pennsylvania stuff. He has a book about I think it's Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot case, uh, Silent Invasion. And he talks about Chestnut Ridge. Yep. Classic. Small Town Monsters has a documentary about that. You like Small Town Monsters, right? Uh, those, they make those documentaries. Yeah, yeah, I've watched a few of them. My my wiki with the Mothman stuff, they said they looked at that when they were making the Mothman documentary, so that's pretty cool. Oh, that, like that is awesome. Mm -hmm. They do good work condensing all the stuff into digestible content for folks, so I can recommend that instead of recommending like a big, long list of books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, there are UFO Sasquatch stuff, and that's just an example of... Um, like direct connection between Mothman and UFOs, like someone who's literally claiming that they saw Mothman like board a UFO or fly into a UFO and disappear. So that's a, an example of how you could mm -hmm. easily call it the UFO bird because it's so linked to UFOs. Yeah. My my last question for you then to, to close things off, I was going to ask if you had any more um, interesting uh, festival experiences. Cause I know you, you had just gone, uh, we were recording this like the day after the Mothman Festival. You just, went yeah. to the, you just went to the Mothman Festival. Do you have any other experiences i guess that weren't already documented in your video oh gosh yeah we you know we we just went and hung around the festival went and uh, checked out all the businesses and the uh the, the the little shops and showed a little bit of what people were selling i saw an interesting looking mothman lego set um got stung by a yellow jacket on the neck <laughs> that stank I uh, ran into a bunch of people I knew, like Joe and Ron, Jeff, a couple of other content creators. But it, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, there were so many people at it. It seems like there's a lot more people at the festival than uh, when I went to the first one. I went to 2016 or 17. It, it's it's pretty big now. Mm -hmm. After it took the, those uh, year breaks for the, for the pandemic, those, those two years. The, the year that came huge. back, and, yeah, in 2022, it was like everyone was packed in like sardines. It was like a, a lot there, of people there, there. Yeah, there were, there there was huge, huge lines for the, sta there was a line to uh, get a shiny honey photo <laughs> even now. Yep. Um, yeah, that was interesting. A, a line um, behind the boss man. So there and was a front... line to get a, a picture with the, the statue, and then there was another line to get a picture with the butt. <laughs> so that was funny. There, there's the the new ice cream. I can't have dairy, but the the new ice cream shop's really neat. It's really cool, and they've got all uh, artwork of all the different cryptids in there, and aliens, and stuff like that. And it, it, it's just so neat to see that that, that kind of thing embraced. Mm -hmm. But it, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I don't see why people wouldn't want to like. People would uh, want to not embrace someone like that, you know. Even if you don't believe in the creature, you know, there's always the possibility, and you should enjoy that kind of, uh, you know, colorful and, and vibrant ideas that are out there. You know, it's an interesting mm -hmm. thing, you know, even because uh, I I've, I've heard some people who like will will make fun of someone for being interested in UFOs or Sasquatch. Oh and, yeah, it's happened and, to me. Yeah, and they'll be like, well, why are you wasting your time with that? Or you know, like, don't don't you know it's not real? And so it's like, well, it doesn't really. That's not the main point though yeah, the it main doesn't matter thrust. if it's real or not you know it's it's, it's fun yeah it's, it's a fascinating thing to learn about it's it's like folklore it's no different than any other like classic folklore like learning, learning about robin hood or john henry you know the flatwoods monster the mothman they're they're cool and so yeah i mean it's such a and such cool designs as well i don't see why people would want to like not embrace uh, that yeah 100 percent agree half the people i meet are really into this stuff and uh, you know some a good deal of them believe in that kind of, I mean, you know, a, a lot of people around here are into that stuff. And then I've had other content creators that I've done collaborations with that tell me, oh, where I live uh, in the mid uh, Midwest, if you even talk about this kind of stuff, they, they think you're some kind of nut. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but around here, you, you talk about that stuff. And most people don't care. <laughs> it seems like. Mm -hmm. Yep, like like if you're in a small town and your small town's got like some kind of monster legend, then yeah, embrace that. You know, learn about it. Wear wear as a t-shirt, a little figure. Yeah, add, add some some flavor, some some color to your mm -hmm. to your world. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. So so you went to the the festival the second day, didn't you? Or did you go both days? Yeah, the second day. I watched the the video there. So you were oh, you were okay. you were going the second day to hope that the crowd would be lighter. Yeah, I was hoping that, and uh, no, it was it was still pretty crowded. Mm -hmm. It still looks like it was more crowded than 2022, though. Yes, 2022 was. Uh, Jeff told me it was 
they had some estimates. He, I think one he said was like possibly 80,000 people there. My, my thinking is I'll probably go every other year. I think that's what I was doing before. I might return at some point. I, I went in uh, from 2016 to 2019. I went every year for those. You were, yeah, we, w- we would have been there at uh, some of the same ones then. Mm-hmm. But then after the pandemic thing, did, you know, and then it came back. And I was just like, nope, that's a lot of people. And you know, now it's less. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll make a return at some point. I don't know. It, it, that's what kept me away from it. I knew it was going to be like that in 2022, and that's what kept me away from it. Uh, it didn't bother me as much this time. I don't know why, yeah. but I, I still hate. I, I can't stand going to cities and crowded places. I can't stand it, but for some reason it didn't bother me as much. Mm. But ugh, I, I just I hate cities and crowds. I just hate yeah. it. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, I just don't like the, the kind of like Comic Con crowd where it's like everyone's like moving an inch by inch as they go down the, the hallway. Yeah, I had a couple instances like that, but yeah, I've been looking for um for other festivals and stuff to to go to at some point soon. The the um like other UFO festivals or like if Wild and Weird makes another convention or festival thing like that. They're something. gonna do yeah they're they're doing a couple. So yeah, I'll, I'll think about going to a, a more smaller one or a more UFO centric one thing like that. Not not the big festivals, you know. I think I kind of had my fill of the, the Mothman Festival. I kind of know what to expect from that, you know, the, all the yeah. vendors and stuff. Uh, even though I, I do like looking around at the vendors, I don't need more uh, don't need more stuff on my shelf or more posters on my wall or more T-shirts, mm-hmm. you know. But just looking yeah. around is fun. The, the speakers, I like. I used to go and record all the speakers. I liked a lot of the speakers. Did you? Which uh, you said you saw Steve Ward. Steve Ward, who's a friend of mine, and I forget who the guy was before him. Okay. Did they, did they stop doing those at the theater? Are we doing them somewhere else? Now? Yeah, they they didn't do it at, at the theater. There's like a um, gosh, what is that little building next to the park? It's not like a retirement home. It's like retired people or something you go hang out at. Uh, I don't know the name of it. Like a community but center. I think yeah, it's some kind of community center, and um, it's right next to the park. I can never pronounce the name of that park, but you know which one I'm talking about. Uh, to to Windowy. To Windowy, yeah. I I can't pronounce it, but yeah. yeah, it's that one. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Any uh topics that I failed to mention or that you wanted to go over before we end this off, or maybe any questions you guys for me? I think we've gone over everything I can think of. Yep, I can be pretty thorough sometimes. So there you go. Okay, so uh, you want to uh, promote some of your stuff for like tell people oh, where yeah. they can uh, your- check. Yeah, check uh, check us out, uh, Spooky Appalachia, uh, YouTube.com uh, slash at Spooky Appalachia, or you just Google us and our, all of our stuff comes up. And there's the blog, SpookyAppalachia.com, and, you know, we're on Twitter and Facebook. I use all the social medias, really, to promote videos, so definitely check us out. Look us up on YouTube. Okay, so thank you for for showing up and for answering all the questions and uh, Mm -hmm. being a guest. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so this is Appalachian Oddity. I've been here with my friend Jimmy of Spooky Appalachia. Uh, We bid you farewell. Thank you for watching. And remember, mountaineers are always free.